And I, I just, my name is John Hamry, I, the president here at CSIS, and it is so good to be able to be back in doing things with real people, you know, and I was just talking with President Lee, uh, you know, it's been, you know, two empty years where we were doing these things virtually. It's just not the same, you know, we just can't get the same interaction and the creativity with each other as we want to think through problems together. And I'm so grateful that we can have this opportunity again. Uh, and I want to say a very sincere thanks to President Lee. This is the seventh time we've had the ROK U.S. Strategic Forum. And it's a very important venue for conversations, important topics. And we are now, of course, at a new phase. Uh, there's a new government in Seoul. The, the UN government is actively getting getting settled and establishing an agenda. We had an opportunity oh, several months back when, um, when uh, Park Jin was here to, it was after the election, but he was kind of showcasing the new agenda for Korea. Uh, and it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time for Korea. Uh, I've said in so many different venues, Korea is a bigger country than it thinks it is. Korea is a more powerful country than it thinks it is. So many Koreans tend to think of themselves as a small, vulnerable country, middle power, uh, you know, on the edge of a continent and worried about its own future. My goodness, this is, there's no country that's been more successful over the last 70 years than Korea. None. It's a powerful country. It has world-class corporations. It's got world-class entertainment. I mean, everybody's following Korean entertainment. I mean, it's a remarkable success. But I think because of the division of Korea, it's made everybody in political channels have nearsighted vision, short vision. There isn't a long vision. And I think we're at that point when we can start developing long-range vision for Korea's leadership in the world. Korea should be a much larger global actor than it is. And, but it's understandable why it's been constrained. But it's now part of our partnership, I believe, to take us to a larger consciousness so that Korea can really flower and blossom in the way it has in the entertainment industry. We should be bringing that now in a much wider range of Korea's skills that it can offer to the world. So it's an exciting time. And I'm really grateful that we can have this opportunity, this conference today. We'll explore some dimensions of it. And I'm really grateful that we have the opportunity. Now, the, I really do want to say how pleased I am that President Lee is here. He has been gracious to come. He's been rather courageous to come here. I mean, it, you know, it was back when it was harder to get into this country, you know, testing and all that kind of jazz. He persevered, and, uh, but he's with us today, and I'm very grateful. So at this page, and I think he's done a tremendous job of shaping the agenda of the Korea Foundation over the last five years. So would you please, with your very warm and sincere applause, welcome President Lee Gun to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Hamry. Um, it's really nice to be back. Uh, I can uh, now finally feel uh, the normalcy here without masks. Uh, President Hamry has been always very supportive of uh, uh, Korea Foundation and CSIS partnership. Um, we uh, really appreciate uh, what you have done for us uh, for the many, many, many years that uh, you were, uh, you have been in, in that position. And, uh, Dr. Victor Cha, he is a celebrity in Korea. Nobody, you know, <laughs> he's everywhere he goes, you know, he's always recognized and uh, he had busy time signing his book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Victor Cha, uh, Dr. Cha uh, has been also very supportive of this partnership. Um, I really admire uh, all the efforts that uh, you have uh, put into this uh, conference. Um, I prepared a uh, 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 a paper, no, that uh, paper, digital uh, welcoming remarks, so I will be somewhat uh, more formal uh, than uh, President Henry. Um, uh, President John Henry and 
the Honorable uh, Yun Yong Gwan, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, distinguished scholars and guests. As president of the Korea Foundation, uh, it is my privilege to welcome you all uh, to the ROK US Strategic Forum 2022, uh, the seventh iteration of the annual forum co-hosted by uh, CSIS, uh, CSIS and the Korea Foundation. Uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you uh, for joining this forum uh, despite uh, your busy schedules. Uh, my special thanks go to uh, President John Hamney again, uh, Dr. Victor Cha, and the staff of the Korea Chair at CSIS for their exceptional preparation of this event. Uh, Distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, uh, today's forum could not have come at a more opportune time. Uh, just two weeks have passed since the first summit meeting between President Yoon and President uh, Biden on the May 21st. Uh, now now I, I would like to take this opportunity to speak a little bit about my take on the summit. Uh, I hope this may provide some food for thoughts uh, for the ensuing sessions. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the two presidents have agreed to upgrade the bilateral alliance to a global comprehensive strategic alliance. Uh, the concept of the global comprehensive strategic alliance is yet to be clarified and enriched by the pr practitioners and scholars of the two countries uh, in the coming months and perhaps years. Uh, but I suspect that the concept is not entirely new uh, to Americans, uh, because the U.S. has been a global power at least since the beginning of the 20th century. On the other hand, uh, Korea's foreign and security policies have rarely escaped the Asian space, uh, if not the Korean Peninsula, and except uh, President No Tae Woo's era, uh, when he had a, a grand strategy in the name of North Politic or Northern Policy, Bukbang Jongchek, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, Korea never had a substantive global vision or strategy uh, that transcended beyond the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, upgrading of the alliance to global comprehensive strategic alliance poses huge challenges to the Korean government, as for the first time in its history, Korea has to come up with a genuine and sophisticated global plan and strategy of its own that at the same time complements uh, the global vision and strategy of the U.S. Uh, as the 10th richest country in the world uh, with a world-class military power, uh, Korea cannot remain as a local or a regional power, uh, but ought to contribute to the peace and well-being of the global village and the planet Earth. Uh, Korea could not have achieved what it has achieved so far without open global market and stable rule-based international order. Uh, therefore, as a global stakeholder, now is the time uh, for Korea to suggest to the world what and how uh, Korea can do to strengthen and enhance the global public goods uh, together with the like-minded countries. Uh, I hope Korea's best strategic thinkers uh, who are gathered here will address essential elements of Korea's new global vision and strategy as Korea is transforming itself into a genuine global pivot state. Uh, second, uh, our two leaders reaffirm their common goal of complete denuclearization of North Korea and agree to bolster the airtight bilateral alliance to that end. Uh, they also warned that North Korea's nuclear program post posed a grave threat to peace and prosperity, not just on the peninsula, but also in the rest of Asia and the world. There may be a threshold uh, over which denuclearization of North Korea, Korea may be beyond the range of possibility. Uh, we need to know if we have already crossed the thre uh, threshold point, and if so, what we can do to push North Korea back to the pre-threshold point uh, perhaps we may, we may never know if the threshold point is crossed or even exists, uh, but we should not give up our honest efforts to peacefully solve uh, the nuclear question on the uh, Korean Peninsula. And third, uh, both sides also discussed boosting 
cooperation in science and technology, and emerging industries, including microchips, batteries, nuclear energy, quantum technology, 5G and 6G technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, space development, and cybersecurity. Uh, as a first step, both agreed to launch an economic security dialogue uh, for close communication and cooperation on matters relating uh, to economic security. Uh, supply chain resilience is one of the top priorities, uh, and governance of cyberspace and global platform companies will also be at the center of discussion. Uh, competition between techno-democratic models and techno-authoritarian models will also be a key issue uh, to be addressed by policymakers and specialists. Uh, these economic security issues, um, these economic security issues will be a huge challenge uh, for both the U.S. and Korea, as they require interdisciplinary analysis and solutions. Uh, fourth. Korea has also decided to participate in the U.S.-led Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, President Yoon mentioned that both countries will contribute to jointly building order uh, in the Indo-Pacific region backed by norm-based international values such as openness, transparency, and inclusiveness. Uh, IPAF is an evolving framework, uh, and if backed by wisdom and creativity, uh, the IPF can harness the rule-based international order so that the order cannot be easily torn down by any revisionist countries in the world. Last but not least, uh, Japan is an essential uh, partner of Korea and the USA to defend the rules-based international order and free and open international market. Uh, between Korea and Japan, there are more similarities uh, than differences if we compare ourselves with any other nations in the world. Uh, politicians are the ones who can cooperate with anybody uh, who shares only one similarity together. Uh, I, have, I hope both Korean and Japanese politicians uh, will become genuine political entrepreneurs who can take advantage of similarities of both countries to enhance peace and prosperity of the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, before closing, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Wang, uh, the keynote speaker for today's event. Uh, he is a globally uh, renowned economist uh, who has both academic and private sector experiences and spent a large portion of his, his private sector experiences uh, in China. Uh, he will be the one uh, to develop and design Korea's economic security concept and policies and therefore, therefore, his views on economic security is indispensable in understanding uh, Korea's policy nexus uh, among trade, technology, traditional security, supply chain, resilience, and whatnot. Uh, this is why we invited, the Korea Foundation invited Dr. Wang, uh, Korean Presidential Secretary for Economic Security, as our keynote speaker this year. Uh, he will be sharing his insights on this issue through uh, video remarks uh, following this uh, opening session. Uh, dear friends, uh, now I would like to close my remarks by expressing my sincere gratitude again uh, to CSIS uh, for co-organizing this forum and to all our invited experts and guests for coming together here and now. Thank you very much. Greetings, Dr. Gunley, the president of the Korea Foundation, Dr. John Helmy, the president of CSIS, and all the distinguished guests who are attending this event, both online and offline today. I would like to begin by congratulating the hosting of the 7th KF CS CSIS Korea-US Strategies Forum at a critical time in which the US and the Republic of Korea are developing into global comprehensive strategic alliance. And personally, it is great pleasure and honor to deliver the keynote speech today. The world is now undergoing a paradigm shift in the global economic order in a way that has never been experienced before. While we are still tending to our wounds from the COVID-19 pandemic and unprecedented inflationary pressure due to the Russia's and provoke the invasion of Ukraine and disruptions of global supply chains are mounting. 
and deepening the concerns of consumers, the workers, businesses, and policymakers. Supply-side shocks are surrounding semiconductors, various parts and components for manufacturing. Critical minerals, energy, and food are becoming more common and complex, while demand-side shocks are usually more easily manageable because the central bank and governments can mobilize monetary and fiscal policy measures. Furthermore, the structural factors such as climate change and digital transformation present both challenges and opportunities for the global economy. The common topic underlying all these issues is economic security. It is difficult to clearly define the concept of economic security. Generally speaking, economic security is a broad concept that includes the security of energy, food, health, and supply chain. For instance, the shortage of energy and food increases energy and food prices, affecting the economic livelihood of people. Yes, there are many, many factors to supply and demand shocks. Recently, many non-traditional types of shocks emerged geopolitical, geoeconomic shocks, along with pandemic and natural disasters. We live in an era where we need to manage the economic vulnerabilities more properly and in a timely manner in order to ensure the security of nations and the livelihood of the people from an economic point of view. The principle of economic efficiency on the free trade and international division of labor which has prevailed in the global economy since the end of the Cold War, is being transformed into an economic security perspective based on stability and sustainability. Disruptions caused by the pandemic were a wake-up call that reminded us of the importance of economic security. In terms of production, manufacturers found it difficult to secure workers and many necessary inputs for production. In terms of transportation and logistics, bottlenecks have caused further strain in the global economy. In short, supply chain disruptions hampered economic activities, consequently threatening our economic security. In response to such disruptions, private companies are struggling, focusing on strengthening the stability and resilience of their supply chains shifting from a just-in-time strategy for maximizing efficiency to a just-in-case strategy to reduce the risk from unexpected disruptions. Another important dimension in the economic security is the technology. The protection of advanced and critical technologies is being highlighted in the race for technological hegemony. With this race, the power game is changing as well. Now it's about which country has technological leadership with the growing importance of preemptively securing and protecting strategic technology and leading international standards. Thus, securing technological leadership is a key element to maintain the traditional hard power, such as military and economic power, and at the same time to play a leading role in the newly emerging industrial revolution namely digital transformation and energy transition. The stability and resilience of the supply chain cannot be achieved by a single country alone. In addition to reshoring, which relocates the overseas production facilities to homeland, friend shoring, which strengthens cooperation in supply and demand of strategic materials and technologies among like-minded countries is becoming more and more important. The key is trust. We can enhance supply chain security by promoting mutual trust. The Korea-US summit meeting held on May 21st is recognized as an important milestone in the effort to develop the alliance between the two countries from the economic and security perspective. During the last 10 years, the Korea-U.S. alliance expanded from a traditional military alliance to an economic alliance through the Korea-Koros FTA. In particular, 
economic security and high-tech cooperation have been elevated to the main pillars of, of the ROK-US alliance, as is demonstrated by the fact that the two leaders studied their meeting at the Samsung Electronics Semiconductor Plant. Through the summit, the two countries agreed to establish an, an economic secu security dialogue between the National Security Councils to strengthen the ROK-US Economic Security and Technology Alliance. In the future, through such economic security dialogue, dialogue we will strengthen strategic communications on economic security matters between the two presidential offices and strengthen cooperation in supply chain and core technological technology fields. Sector by sector, the US and Korea agreed to work together to build resi resilient and reliable supply chains by promoting cooperation in respective early warning systems and critical mineral sector and foreign exchange market to secure emerging and future technologies partnership for nuclear energy, quantum, and space technology will be greatly strengthened. In addition, two countries decide to expand and strengthen cooperation on global economic agendas such as climate change, health, and internet as a global comprehensive strategic alliance. At the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, namely IPEF for Prosperity Summit meeting that took place two days after the summit meeting between the two countries, Korea expressed its willingness to actively participate and provide full support as one of the 13 founding members. At the meeting, President Yoon song yeol remarked that Korea has achieved a rapid economic growth and development based on liberal democracy and market economy. Through the IPEF, Korea will share its experience and cooperate with the countries in the region. region. In particular, Korea's core competence and advanced technologies in the areas of supply chain, digital transformation, and clean energy can contribute to ushering in an era of shared prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. As the IPF is now in its infancy, Korea as a global the pivotal state will continue to actively contribute to the development of the IPF as a key platform for strengthening regional economic security. Immediately after taking office, President Yoon song yeol emphasized that the economy is the security and security is the economy. Establishing, establishing economic security as a key pillar of the new administration's national policy objective. Accordingly, Korea is strengthening international cooperation at various levels while reorganizing domestic systems to strengthen economic security. First of all, the Office of the Economic Security in charge of the economic security matters was established in the presidential office to coordinate the economic security related agendas and establish the strategies through collaboration with many ministries. This office will also be responsible for above mentioned economic security dialogue between the NSCs of the ROK and the United States. Under the Prime Minister's office, the cabinet the plans to establish a public-private joint emerging security committee in charge of the emerging security issues such as infectious disease, supply chains, and climate change. This emerging committee will be in charge of the coordinating and reviewing the policies established and implemented by each ministry. To respond to the supply chain crisis, the Basic Act on Supply Chain Management for Economic Security is also being prepared this year. This Act, the plans to focus on institutionalizing the entire supply chain process, including supply chain risk, risk detection, risk prevention, and risk management. To this end, 
The legislation will include uh, the establishment of a national basic plan for supply chain management, establishment and advancement of an unintegrated early warning system, expansion of the support for enhancing supply chain resilience and the establishment of supply chain fund and the response system in case of a crisis. In parallel with domestic uh, response, Korea will strengthen international cooperation to build a complementary system by participating in an economic uh, consultative, consultative body among countries that share the universal values. I expect that the IPF will be the most important platform for such regional cooperation. We also expand our network of bilateral and multilateral economic agreements and actively participate in discussions on digital economic norms and standards. In Korea's relations with China, our close neighbor and largest trading partner, we will strengthen substantive cooperation based on the principle of mutual respect and mutual benefit and equality. In particular, Given the highly interconnected nature of the supply chain between Korea and China, it is necessary for Korea to work together with China to stabilize the supply chain, including by using the economic cooperation chapter of the Korea-China FTA. Having said that, supply chain disruptions, which is a major threat to economic security, cannot be solved by a single country alone. This is because the global supply chain is uh, intertwined in multiple dimensions and is also linked to service sectors such as logistics and finance. Therefore, solidarity and cooperation among countries with the complementary supply chain structure is more important than ever. With their respective roles in the International Division of Labor, each country cooperate with other countries while taking advantage of their comparative advantages. In promoting cooperation, I think mutual trust is very important in order to remove factors that cause the fragmentation of the supply chain. The Korean companies such as Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motors are rapidly expanding their investment in the U.S. Those investment decisions are basically motivated by their own global business strategies for securing the U.S. customers. However, without mutual trust and strong commitment for future prosperity between the two countries, private sectors' big ambitions cannot be materialized. I hope that today's forum will serve as an opportunity to enhance the mutual trust and understanding between the two countries. Once again, I would like to thank the Korea-US Strategic Forum for inviting me today. Thank you. Our, our keynote uh, speaker is on the way. He's, he'll be about four minutes late, um, but we'll start um, in five minutes. Thank you. We'll take a quick short break.
Okay. Okay, welcome back everyone uh, from our very short break uh, for our, our second keynote uh, speaker, uh, Daniel Crittenbrink from the State Department. Um, again, welcome uh, to our audience online, to everybody in the room. Good morning, good evening. Uh, my name is Victor Cha, Senior Vice President for Asia and uh, Korea Chair here at CSIS, uh, Professor at Georgetown. Um, our next session will be a very special one with uh, Daniel Crittenbrink, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, uh, formerly also Ambassador to Vietnam, long distinguished career in the Department of State. I first met him when we were doing six party talks, and uh, yeah, way back in the day, and Daniel was at the embassy in uh, Beijing. Uh, and the, this conversation will be uh, moderated by our very good friend, uh, Mark Lippert, Ambassador Mark Lippert, Executive Vice President at Samsung, um, former U.S. Ambassador to Korea, and of course, most famously known as host of the CSIS YouTube show, uh, Capital Cable. So let me turn it over to these two very distinguished gentlemen, and uh, we look forward for an interest to an interesting discussion. So first, uh, uh, Ambassador Crittenbrink. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Crittenbrink, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and I'm truly honored to be with you here this morning at CIS, CSIS. Uh, thank you to my good friend, Dr. Victor Cha, for inviting me and for including me. Thanks uh, for everything that you do and for what you've done for uh, our country. It's great to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I'm back uh, from just uh, not even two weeks ago having had the honor of uh, accompanying President Biden to the Republic of Korea for his uh, very successful and very important uh, visit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that uh, uh, this morning, of course. First, I'd like, again, to thank all of our friends here at CSIS uh, and uh, at the Korea Foundation, particularly uh, President John Hamry, uh, Dr. Victor Cha, President Lee. Uh, thank you very much for hosting this seventh ROK U.S. Uh, strategic dialogue. Um, Again, uh, having just come back from uh, the visit to the Republic of Korea, I'm particularly delighted to be here. I think uh, the Biden-Harris administration has made clear uh, that our foreign policy is predicated on revitalizing our relationships with our allies, partners, and friends. Absolutely delighted to see that our alliance with the ROK uh, is stronger uh, than ever. Uh, that is, of course, the result of decades worth of work including uh, some stellar work by my friend, Ambassador Mark Lippert. And Mark, it's great to see you here this morning and look forward to uh, our conversation. Uh, but the fact is that for nearly seven decades, the USROK Alliance has been the linchpin, the linchpin of peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific uh, and across the globe. Uh, we're proud to have such close ties at every level uh, and I think that uh, has been demonstrated and shown by the friendship between the American and the Korean people uh, and the incredibly warm welcome and hospitality that President Yoon offered to President Biden just 10 days uh, after President Yoon uh, had taken office. Uh, the relationship between the United States and, and the Republic of Korea is built on many things, but it is also built on our shared values, our commitment to democracy, transparency, and responsive governance our common grounding in the protection of human rights, our shared vision of maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific region, strengthening and upholding the rules-based international order, and advancing peace and prosperity for our nations and for people everywhere. Uh, today, many of those val values, of course, are being challenged by authoritarian leaders who seek to undermine and reshape the rules-based international order for their own purposes. And that's why it's crucial that the United States, the Republic of Korea, Japan, many other partners and allies around the world stand together and work together, not only to address the challenges that we face, but also to show just how our strong democracies like ours can deliver. And we're doing just that. We've worked together to respond to Russian President Vladimir Putin's premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and utterly horrific war against Ukraine. 
Since Putin uh, launched his full-scale invasion in February, the Republic of Korea has coordinated sanctions and export controls alongside the United States and other allies and partners around the world. And it's, uh, uh, the ROK has taken steps to help stabilize energy markets, and it has offered significant economic and humanitarian support for the government and people of Ukraine. And we're incredibly grateful to our South Korean allies for the steps uh, that they've taken. Good to see my friend Rob Rapson here as well. You, you know, of course, uh, uh, and we're involved uh, in much of the work in building this alliance as well. It's great to see you here uh, this morning. Uh, the United States and the Republic of Korea are committed to strengthening our close engagement as we work to take on a range of other uh, important and difficult challenges of the 21st century. But it's important at the outset to also underscore that the U.S. commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea and to strengthening our combined defense posture consistent with the US ROK Mutual Defense Treaty is ironclad, including the US extended deterrence commitment to the ROK using the full range of US defense capabilities. But beyond traditional security challenges, we're expanding our cooperation on regional and international cyber policy. We're working together to deter cyber adversaries, strengthen the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, combat cybercrime, secure cryptocurrency and blockchain applications, undertake capacity building and cyber exercises, and increase information sharing and military-to-military -military cyber cooperation. We also welcome the Republic of Korea's increasing dialogue and practical cooperation with NATO, alongside NATO's other Indo-Pacific partners, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. The ROK and NATO can offer each other valuable perspectives and experience as we seek to promote cooperative security and support the rules-based international order uh, across the globe. Uh, however, as uh, everyone in this room knows, uh, our alliance is not defined uh, solely by defense ties. Increasingly, it is also defined by our strategic economic and technology partnership. Much of what happens in the coming decades will depend on how well governments harness innovation, and especially the transformations afoot in clean energy and digital and tech sectors while improving the resilience of our economies. We have a strong history of partnership with the ROK in APEC, for example, which the United States is excited and honored to be hosting in 2023. And we were delighted that the ROK joined us in launching the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, in Tokyo on May 23. Through these and other platforms, we're deepening our cooperation on critical uh, and emerging technologies, economic and energy security, pandemic response, and addressing the climate crisis among a host uh, of other issues. The foundation of our economic relationship is the Chorus U.S. Free Trade Agreement, which celebrated its 10th anniversary earlier this year. The United States is the second largest investor in the ROK, and ROK foreign direct investment in the United States continues to grow, uh, more than tripling in the last decade, from 19.7 billion to 62.4 uh, billion. The ROK is now the second largest Asian source of foreign direct investment into the United States. Truly uh, remarkable. Uh, while in Seoul, uh, I had the, the pleasure of, of witnessing uh, the, uh, the manifestation uh, of our close uh, economic ties. Uh, President Biden and President Yoon uh, together highlighted our forward-looking economic partnership. For example, during their visit to Samsung's Pyeongtaek facility, which is essentially the same facility that Samsung is building in Taylor, Texas, uh, and that will create 3,000 high-paying U.S. jobs. Uh, our two presidents showcased how Korean and American innovation are working in tandem to produce the most advanced semiconductors in the world. During uh, the president's visit, uh, Hyundai Motor Corporation also announced more than $11 billion in new investment in American manufacturing including a new commitment of $5.7 billion for advanced automotive technology and a $5.5 billion investment to open a new electrical, uh, electric vehicle and battery manufacturing facility in Savannah. And that facility will create more than 8,000 jobs. Clean energy investments like this have the double benefit of helping both of us reach our climate goals while creating good jobs that will benefit American workers and businesses. Investments like these are bringing our two countries even closer together. And these increased connections will help strengthen our supply chains, secure them against shocks, and give both of our economies a competitive edge. We believe that our already strong economic relationship will only grow stronger in the days ahead. Now, 
Uh, alongside our economic ties, we're also working to tackle the most pressing challenges of today uh, and tomorrow. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been steadfast bilateral partners, as evidenced through the U.S. government's donation of vaccines to the ROK, which the Korean people then paid forward uh, through their own vaccine donations to other countries. Our two governments and our private sectors are working to combat the COVID-19 pandemic globally, including through the COVID-19 Global Action Plan. President Biden's and President Yoon's participation in the May 12 COVID-19 Summit demonstrated our country's resolve in the fight against COVID-19, and we thank the ROK for announcing an additional $300 million commitment to this fight. Truly impressive. Now, I, I hope that the length of my remarks are demonstrating the breadth and the depth of our global partnership and alliance, uh, and, alliance and I apologize. I have a, just a few more minutes to highlight the incredible work that we're doing together, and then uh, I look forward to diving in with Ambassador Lippert to hopefully take some questions. Uh, so again, the United States and the ROK are working together to strengthen multilateral efforts to prevent, prepare for, and respond to future infectious disease threats. And we're accelerating our cooperation and innovation in cancer research, cutting edge cancer treatments, mental health research, early detection, and treatment of mental health disorders. Yet another area in which the United States and ROK are working to strengthen our cooperation is in response to the climate crisis. During President Biden's recent trip to Seoul, he and President Yoon reaffirmed our respective commitments to our nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, and we're implementing strong efforts to align policies across all sectors. The two presidents committed to enhance collaboration to address global methane emissions and to strengthen cooperation in clean energy fields, including hydrogen, clean shipping, accelerated deployment of zero emission vehicles, and allowing international financial flows with the achievement of global net zero emissions by 2050. Um, both of our countries have also benefited greatly from an open, free, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. And we are committed to working together to combat the rising threats posed by digital authoritarianism, defend human rights, and foster an open network of networks that ensures the free flow of information globally. We're also working together to develop open, transparent, and secure 5G and 6G network devices and architectures using open RAN approaches both at home and abroad. Um, the United States and the Republic of Korea are also working to align our respective approaches to promote our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific region. That includes basic principles like preventing barriers to lawful commerce and respecting international law governing the freedom of navigation and overflight. And it includes as well, preserving peace and stability everywhere, including across the Taiwan Strait. In order to, to promote this shared vision for the Indo-Pacific, we must also have a robust and effective trilateral relationship between and among the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. Together, we are building a positive, forward-looking agenda, including trilateral security cooperation, defending and promoting human rights, gender equity, and the international rules-based order, while also addressing economic and security uh, and energy security, supply chain resiliency, the climate crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think as many uh, of you have seen, uh, Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman is now in Seoul, where uh, over the next couple of days, she'll be carrying out a very important bilateral program with our Republic of Korea allies, and then we'll hold uh, an important trilateral meeting with her uh, Korean and Japanese counterparts, and I'm confident that they will make uh, significant progress there. Um, of course, it's hard for me to give a speech uh, on the USROK alliance and not say something about the DPRK. So let me make a few uh, brief comments. The United States, the ROK, and Japan continue to be in full alignment on our approach to countering the threat posed by the DPRK. Our goal remains the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Unfortunately, the DPRK has increased significantly the pace and scale of its ballistic missile launches uh, over the last year and even over the last few days. These provocative launches are violations of multiple UN Security Council resolutions and they threaten the peace and security of the Indo-Pacific region and the entire international community. That is why Secretary Blinken, along with ROK Foreign Minister Pak Chin, uh, and Japanese Foreign Minister Hayashi uh, issued a statement on May 27 condemning 
the DPRK's recent ballistic missile launches and calling on it to abandon its unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs and instead engage in diplomacy. The Secretary, together with the G7 foreign ministers and the EU high representative, also issued uh, a statement last week condemning the DPRK's continued illicit activity. In addition, the United States has been leading efforts in the United Nations to rally the world in responding to the DPRK's repeated violations of international law. We do, however, continue to believe that we can find a peaceful and diplomatic resolution with the DPRK. We have a practical, calibrated approach. The United States harbors no hostile intent towards the DPRK, and the path to dialogue remains open. We urge the DPRK to take that path, to commit to serious and sustained diplomacy, and to refrain from pursuing further destabilizing activities. However, I want to be absolutely clear. We should make no mistake. Our commitment to upholding our security commitments remains, as I said at the top, absolutely ironclad. We remain absolutely focused on defending the United States, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and other allies and partners in the region from security threats, including those posed by the DPRK's missile and nuclear programs. We are also gravely concerned by the serious outbreak of COVID-19 underway in the DPRK right now and how it may affect the health and well-being of the North Korean people. We continue to support efforts to provide humanitarian assistance and COVID-19 vaccines to the DPRK. Um, we see this humanitarian crisis as separate from making progress on denuclearization, and we do not and will not link the two. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to note that none of the cooperation, the long list of cooperation that I've outlined here this morning, uh, could take place between the United States and Republic of Korea without the deep uh, and abiding people-to-people -people ties of the American and Korean peoples. Since 1955, more than 1.7 million Korean students have enrolled in, secretary, in secondary institutions in the United States. During the 2020 and 21 academic year, nearly 40,000 Korean students came to the United States, placing the ROK as one of the top senders of international students to the United States on a per capita basis, uh, outpacing again on a per capita basis both the PRC uh, and India. In addition, more than 10,000 U.S. and ROK citizens have participated in U.S. government-sponsored exchange programs over the years. So in closing, I would like to reiterate that today, the U.S. ROK Alliance has matured and evolved into a global, comprehensive, strategic alliance as President Biden and President Yoon announced in their joint statement of May 21. Through close ties between our two dynamic populations, our extensive economic and investment links, and a shared commitment to democracy, human rights, and the rules-based international order, I'm confident that the United States and the Republic of Korea together can and will meet any challenges and seize the opportunities presented before us across the Indo-Pacific and around the world. Thank you very much. What do you think, Mark? Thank you. Yeah, okay. I, 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 job, as I, said. Perfect. I know we got like about five minutes. I'm yours for as long as you'll have. No, no, five minutes. We've got to keep you on time. We're doing the nation's <laughs> business here. You know, can't it's, monopolize it's you. It's really, CSIS. really great to see you. Thanks again. It's great to see so many friends here. Thanks for organizing this. And what, a, what an amazing agenda. I wish I could stay for the whole thing. If I had one minor quibble with the agenda I saw, though, I think the next session is focusing on what the United States and the ROK can do together regionally. I would probably say, what can we do together regionally and globally? Because the case that I've outlined we fully embrace uh, a global Korea, and it's really extraordinary what Korea has uh, achieved, and we are so excited that uh, together as allies and partners, we can do so many tremendous things together. No, it's, it's well put, Dan. And, and by the way, thanks for everything you've done. As no, well this thanks. This relationship for our country, truly uh, extraordinary. No, absolutely, and, and thanks for a, a great tour de force. I, I'm moderating the next panel, so I'm, I'm gonna take those as notes, <laughs> and we're good to go. Uh, Victor, take a note too, right? So, uh, but thanks for, really, a, tre a tremendous speech. Thank thanks you. for your service. Uh, you. It's been, a, I know, a long road for you in terms of DCM in Beijing, NSC, True. 
uh, ambassador in Vietnam, and now this job. It's these are hard jobs, and we appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's an I, honor. I, there's just a few minutes left, and I, I again we want to keep you on time here, Dan. So I, I just think the the question that I think on is on everybody's minds is the summit. Uh, yeah. And you were there. You I were was. behind the scenes. I saw you. You looked like you had no sleep. Uh, so <laughs> you, you know how I, these trips go. I could no tell sleep. It. But um, you run on adrenaline because it's so exciting to be there. It truly, truly was an honor. And and so talk. Just walk us through a little bit about the summit. You've got this sweeping agenda. Yeah. How did we accomplish it? And then sort of priorities moving forward between the two sides. Thank you. Fantastic questions, Mark. Look, I think the thing that jumped out at me the most was uh, uh, our Korean allies uh, were kind enough to invite President Biden to visit Seoul just 10 days uh, after President Yoon's inauguration. And I think the thing I was most impressed by and most, most pleased by was to see the development of the relationship between our two presidents. I think President Yoon went out of his way to show tremendous hospitality to President Biden, which was deeply appreciated. I don't know if I assume this crowd, you saw many of the visuals, you saw the different events that were designed to demonstrate, again, the strength and breadth of this alliance, right? From these amazing investment events uh, with Samsung and Hyundai to the joint visit to the Air Operations uh, Command Center uh, at Osan, to uh, the state dinner, the important bilateral events and all of that. But the thing that stood out to me the most, again, was the development of that relationship between our two presidents. I think it's fair to say that President Yoon and President Biden found a lot of common ground. I think they connected uh, at a personal and a leader to leader level. Uh, and I think that they discovered to no surprise uh, that they share a very similar outlook, I think, uh, on the world. Uh, the kind of world and region in which we want to live, the principles and values that we hold dear that we think are so vital to our shared peace and prosperity. So I think, again, uh, the way that they bonded in the in-depth in exchange that they had, I thought, was maybe, uh, to my mind, the single most important outcome of the entire summit. And it seemed genuine in terms of, I had a glimpse at Piontech, right? I was there, of course. saw well, you thank you for what you, uh, <laughs> now I know how you noticed my sleeplessness because <laughs> you were so up close and personal. Thanks, but, by the way, that was, that was a brilliant event. And by the way, I wasn't exactly sure when I was at the Samsung event. If you see it, it was just extraordinary. Um, they had these live pictures of, uh, of American workers in Samsung factories yes. and Korean workers as well. And I was, is that really live? Is that, that was it, live. Was really it was live. really live. Really live. Yes, um, it was. Just amazing. No, absolutely. And, and I, I would just say that the two leaders started talking just impromptu, right? Almost like this yeah. Great and you know, it is interesting because uh, you know we, we rolled in on uh, on Air Force One and went right to mm -hmm. that event. And so this was actually the first occasion for the two presidents to meet. I think from the beginning. Uh, they really hit it off. And then we, when we rolled into the formal meetings uh, next day, they went, uh, they went well beyond what they were scheduled, including a, a lengthy one-on-one -on -one session. So I think they, they, they really bonded and really, as I said, discovered they have a very similar outlook. And absolutely. And, and last, really last question, let's get you out of here. So then how, you know, just dovetailing with your experience, you're, you're a Chinese speaker, you're a Mandarin speaker, you were DCM there, you um, were the NSC uh, senior director dealing with a lot of uh, issues on China. That's, your current that's when job. we worked together. That's, that's right. Sadly, um, the um, I, uh, for for you, um, the um, the the question is then how uh, the elephant in the room is always about China, right? In terms of how we work on this together, the outcome in and around uh, our shared outlook on handling or engaging Beijing. You heard the the Blue House senior secretary for economics had put out some uh, or economic security put out some uh, guideposts your thoughts on how the alliance will deal with this and then we'll let you get on with your day. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Yeah, look, uh, I think, um, you know, the, the opportunities and challenges posed by the People's Republic of China, you know, are important uh, to all of us in the region. So it's no surprise that this would be important to the United States and the Republic of Korea as well. I, I think what I would do is I would uh, refer you to Secretary Blinken's uh, uh, speech on China uh, really just a, a few days ago, and he, he outlined our framework and maybe just a, a couple of key highlights there. The framework that he announced, uh, the conceptual way that we like to describe our approach to uh, the PRC is invest, align, and compete. Uh, the United States of America will continue to make investments in our own uh, competitiveness and our strength here at home. Uh, we will align closely with our allies, partners, and friends, including the Republic of Korea uh, around the world. Uh, and then we will uh, compete 
uh, and we intend to uh, win in, in the key areas of competition between the United States and China going forward. Uh, but of course, uh, we are cooperating uh, in a range of areas where our interests dictate and we remain open to that. I think in the context of the President's visit uh, and our important alliance with Korea, what I would say is when we talk about China, we like to focus on what our affirmative vision is and what we stand for. What do we stand for? We stand for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we stand for a region and a world uh, in which disputes are governed and resolved peacefully uh, and in accordance with international law, where large countries don't bully the weak, uh, where countries can trade uh, and travel uh, freely, where all countries remain the capacity, maintain uh, and retain the capacity and the ability to make their own decisions regarding their sovereignty free of coercion. Those are the things that we proactively stand for. I'm confident that we've never been more aligned on those issues than we are today with the Republic of Korea. So that's where I'd like uh, to maintain uh, our focus, and I'm confident that's, that's where it is. And I think on virtually uh, every issue across the board, uh, Washington and Seoul see eye to eye, and I would argue uh, that's the case with China as well. Now, uh, all of us have uh, important but complex relationships with the People's Republic of China. Um, we're not asking countries to choose uh, between uh, Washington and Beijing. What we're focused on is making sure all countries have a choice and, again, can make their own decisions free of coercion. I think as long as we uh, remain focused on that positive agenda and what we stand for, not what we stand against, I'm confident we'll find uh, our way forward. All right. Outstanding, Dan. Uh, I was going to say you beat me to the punch on my follow-up, which is it sounds like there's a lot of gra common ground on the ROK approach of mutual benefit, mutual respect, equality in terms of their dealings with uh, Beijing and the U.S. approach outlined in Secretary Blinken's speech. So with that, I was, I'll, the get off the stage question is, you know, you are famous in Vietnam for a music video that went viral on YouTube. Any more video plans in the future? Definitely not. Well, you never say never, but I'm pretty confident that I'm a one-hit wonder. Um, I'll also say, Mark, that uh, I spend most days having forgotten about that rap video, but uh, there's rarely a day that goes by that I'm not reminded of it. But can I say, it was such a pleasure to do. Uh, I do think it says something about how far we've come with another key partner, and that's with the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, where uh, an American ambassador thought it was a good idea to do a rap, to do part of it in Vietnamese, and to do it in celebrating uh, the Tet holiday in Vietnam, and that we thought it would play well with the Vietnamese audience, and it, and it did. And that says something about, I think, uh, our friendship and partnership that we've grown there as well. But no, I, I, don't, I don't think you'll see me doing too many uh, no other videos. videos. Well, I, but I, but I, you, ne I, you never say never. But, yeah, I was just going to say, I did work for YouTube, so I'm going to claim the residual rights to the next <laughs> one. So anyway, Dan, thanks again it's for deal. the tour de force. Hey, Ambassador Mark Lippert, uh, Dr. Victor Cha, all of our friends here um, at, uh, at CSIS, thank you so much for having me here today. All right, thanks. Great speech. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.
there's the clock. Okay, good. Okay. Are you set? I think we're set. Yeah. So he'll give us the cue. All right. So online audience is on now. So. Who? Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone here in DC. Good evening, everyone in Korea. Good day to everybody around the world. Uh, welcome to panel one of the U uh, ROK U.S. Strategic Forum 2022. Uh, we just heard two scintillating keynote addresses. We're off to a running start, and we're going to round this out with panel one uh, this morning. And we have an all-star packed lineup here on panel one of Heavy hitters, as they will, would say in, in baseball terms, but let me get into their bios. You know them well. Uh, anyone who's been in, in and around the Korea issue set knows, knows this crew very well, but let me introduce them quickly, uh, their formal uh, bios and introductions, and look them up online, too, because I will not go through their, all of their uh, myriad of accomplishments, but I will get through some of them. So let's go first to Dr. Yong Kwan Yoon. Uh, Foreign Minister Yoon is the Professor Emeritus at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University from 2003 to 2004. He happened to serve as, in a small position as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade <laughs> at the Republic of Korea. He also worked as a senior visiting scholar with the Korea Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs from 2020 to 2021, where I suspect he overlapped with my good friend Ash Carter, uh, and also taught uh, at Harvard University writ large. Uh, he taught at University of California, Davis, served as chairman of the advisory committee of the parliamentary diplomacy of the Korean National Assembly from 19 to 20, and a host of other accomplishments. He has published uh, over a dozen books, 80 articles in the fields of international political economy, Korea's foreign policy, and inter-Korean relations. Uh, he received a doctoral degree from SAIS right here in Washington. Welcome, Minister Yoon. All right, next up, Robert Rapson, senior diplomat of the United States, retired recently uh, 30, after an illustrious 39-year career, year career in the Foreign Service, really that spanned the Indo-Pacific region, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, India, and Afghanistan, touched all four corners there. Uh, as Charge of Affairs and a Deputy Chief of Mission at U.S. Embassies in Seoul, Tokyo, and Kuala Lumpur, he advanced significant U.S. political, economic, commercial, security, law enforcement, public diplomacy interests with those countries in the region. Also, uh, a range of other service uh, in Korea specific. He was uh, director of the Office of Korean Affairs at the Department of State, uh, 2012 to 2015, which is a critically important, but often unrecognized or un under-recognized job in the State Department. It does yeoman's work uh, in re making sure the bilateral relationship stays on top, and Rob handled that really well. He was also Deputy Economic Counselor and Senior Trade Officer at U.S. Embassy Seoul from 97 to 2000, Vice Consul at U.S. Embassy Seoul in U.S. Consulate Busan 84 to 86, recipient of numerous State Department individual and group superior honor awards, BA in International Relations from Penn State, Nittany Lions Go, and as a graduate of Singapore American High School. Welcome, Rob, to the panel. All right, next up, my favorite retired Air Force Intelligence Officer, Dr. Sang Yoon Ma. I'm giving away part of his bio here. He's a professor of international relations at the Catholic University of Korea, formerly he served as Director General for Strategy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 16 to 19. He was also a visiting fellow at Brookings, and the Wilson Center here in DC, also a think tank in Stockholm, ISDP, and fulfilling uh, military service responsibilities. He worked, as I previously noted, ROK and Air Force Intelligence Officer, 89 to 92. Dr. Ma received his BA and MA in International Relations from Seoul National University. As a Swire Scholar, he continued his studies at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, where he received his DPhil in International Relations, and his main areas of research include East Asian international politics, U.S. foreign policy, Korea-U.S. relations, and Cold War history. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Victor Cha. I don't even need to use his bio because I introduce him every week, every other week on the <laughs> Capitol Cable. He's the Vice Dean at Georgetown University. He's uh, runs the Korea chair uh, here at CSIS, former Bush NSC. Uh, also, I think, uh, plays a mean game of tennis or at least long distance <laughs> swimming in Hawaii. There's a whole myriad of facts here, but everybody knows Victor and Victor, welcome to the panel as well. So with that, let's get into it. And I'm gonna go to foreign minister, the foreign minister first because uh, one, he's the most uh, senior person on the panel and two, I wanted to uh, 
really take advantage of his expertise in academia, but also as minister. And it really dovetails with what we uh, talked about with Secretary Crittenbrink. And Secretary Crittenbrink admonished us to talk more globally, uh, vice regionally, okay, so stipulated. But let's pick up off of the summit here, Foreign Minister. You've been through a couple summits yourself. Uh, and let's go right to the, the crux of the matter. We've got, I'm gonna talk about three quick pieces, right? We've got the joint statement that outlined the outcomes, number one. Number two, I would say the two keynotes we heard today, which were summations of where the relationship is and is, is headed on a range of issues. And three, the personal chemistry between the two uh, presidents, which we've heard a lot about on both sides, and I think people who were there in and around the summit would attest to that there was a chemistry uh, and there was alignment, and leaders matter. So in terms of this next step of working together globally, something that isn't new, it's been around for a while, but probably more emphasized here today uh, at coming off of this summit, where are we headed in terms of the relationship, number one? And number two, how would you sift through how to prioritize this big, broad, sweeping agenda that we've now heard, touching on everything from people to people to values to economic security to some of the more traditional security areas? Foreign Minister, the floor is yours. Broad brush strokes, and please get us, get us off to a fast start here on panel one. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction and uh, 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 wonderful uh, questions uh, to think about. Uh, I think the uh, Biden Yoon summit was uh, successful for a few reasons. Uh, first, from a Korean uh, I mean, uh, observer's perspective, I think it was a quite successful event. First, um, the value factor, uh, you mentioned already that, about that, and uh, uh, I think there are I mean, uh, important uh, universal uh, values which are respected by global communities, such as uh, uh, democracy, freedom, and uh, 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 human rights, uh, the rules-based international order, something like that. Uh, I think Korean diplomacy, Korea's diplomacy, uh, I mean, should uh, be guided by those uh, principles in one way or another. However, uh, in the recent uh, several years, uh, Korean diplomacy tended to be much influenced by some kind of emotional nationalism rather than universal uh, values. Uh, so as the result, uh, Korea's diplomacy could not mobilize full support uh, domestically and internationally. Um, and this joint statement uh, confirmed that uh, I mean, alliance relationship and the uh, future uh, vision for both allies as a kind of global comprehensive strategic uh, I mean, uh, alliance. Uh, should be rooted deeply in those common values. And I think this is important uh, factor, and this is one of the most important uh, I mean, uh, implication of the, the summit uh, meeting uh, from a medium and long-term perspective. On the other hand, uh, the summit meeting and the joint statement uh, widened the scope of Korea's diplomacy. Uh, Korea's diplomacy tended to narrowly focus on the Korean Peninsula issue. I think it is quite understandable for uh, Korean leaders to try to stabilize inter-Korean relationship and try to establish a permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. However, I think uh, it shouldn't take uh, all the other uh, diplomatic issues hostage. <laughs> And uh, it is quite uh, uh, the case, uh, especially when Korea has become number 10 uh, largest economy in the world. And, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, it, it needs to focus uh, more on how to uh, contribute to the global community. So I think this uh, joint statement uh, provided 
uh, various areas and methods of cooperation, mutual cooperation in that regard, uh, contributing to the global community more actively. And the third uh, important implication of the summit meeting was that uh, from a national interest perspective of both the United States and South Korea, we both allies are facing serious challenges, that is economic security, and uh, also, I mean, uh, upgrading technologies. And this joint statement uh, provided uh, various uh, issues and areas of mutual cooperation in that regard. So I think uh, those three, for those three reasons, I think uh, the summit meeting was quite successful. Uh, however, I mean, uh, I heard uh, Assistant Secretary's uh, speech this morning, and I was quite uh, uh, assured about uh, I mean, uh, security uh, of the Korean uh, I mean, peninsula. However, I'm a little concerned uh, because uh, probably pre President Biden and his team may be preoccupied uh, by many <coughs> other important issues like uh, uh, the Ukraine war, China issues, uh, Iranian negotiation, and uh, all the other uh, important domestic uh, political issues, including midterm elections or something like that. So I'm wondering how much uh, political capital will be left for President Biden and his team to invest on, uh, on, on, on the North Korean issue. On the other hand, uh, North Korea is becoming uh, more and more impatient. And there's a clear I mean, uh, mismatch between the US situation and North Korean situation, which may become a kind of important uh, structural cause for the coming kind of uh, crisis. So I think it's time for preventive diplomacy and I would like to uh, I mean, uh, recommend uh, the Biden administration to seriously consider dispatching a special uh, high-level uh, envoy to North Korea uh, to I mean, mediate the crisis situation and to begin dialogue. We have lots of escalation mechanism on the Korean Peninsula, but we don't have de-escalation mechanism. That's the big problem, I think. Thank you. Well, excellent. Let me just follow up on the, that last point and not to turn this into a North Korea discussion, but Mr. Minister, do you, it seems as though the comment you're making is that the current structure where we've got Sung Kim as ambassador in Jakarta, but dual had it as special envoy for North Korean issues is something you would like to see modified and changed and perhaps either a full-time envoy or a high-level envoy or perhaps a more permanent line ser line serving official like the deputy secretary go to North Korea as a one-off uh, engagement what 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 are you proposing here mr. minister yeah, high-level official as an uh, one one off one off okay engagement. Got it. to complement the yeah, work of some Kim. yeah of course yes. okay all right thanks mr. minister for the clarification all right Victor over to you uh, wake up there you know I'm joking um, uh, first uh, I'm gonna ask you two questions one is since we're on North Korea it was interesting that th this issue did not feature prominently or as prominently as in past summits, uh, and I was going to ask Secretary Crittenbrink that question had we had more time, but over to you for that question, and then I want to come back to you on a follow-up on kind of some values issues. Sure. Um, well, first, uh, thanks for um, um, doing our session this morning with, with Dan, and also thanks for chairing this, this, uh, this panel, Mark, with a really great group of uh, experts and scholars. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, normally when we see a summit meeting between um, the U.S. and the South Korean president, particularly a first summit meeting, the featured item always is North Korea. Um, but as uh, Dan Crittenbrink said, and as you witnessed personally, President Biden arrived in Korea, and the first place he went was not the DMZ or not um, um, uh, uh, intense discussions on North Korea, but went to the Samsung plant in Pyeongtaek. 
uh, which really s sent a message about, uh, about the alliance relationship, about the diversification of the scope of the alliance relationship. On North Korea, you know, the message I think was, it was low key, but it was very clear, which is that there is airtight alignment between the two, not just in words, but actually in the way they think about the issue. Uh, this re the return to this phrase denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, denuclearization of North Korea, as President Lee said in his speech this morning, um, you know, th those are words that have meaning, um, given where we were coming from on this, on this issue in the past. And so I thought that was quite significant. And that really the serious discussions and more behind the scenes, I think, behind closed doors, not as public, uh, when it came to North Korea was really on the question of extended deterrence, where uh, you heard Dan Crittenbrink used very clear language when he talked about uh, extended deterrence and the U.S. commitment to defend South Korea with the full range of capabilities. Again, that's specifically chosen language to show that there's a real shoring up the, of the security commitment, the extended deterrence commitment. So um, I think a focus on North Korea, but largely in terms of the alliance, um, of course, open to diplomacy when the time presents itself, but uh, there doesn't seem to be much interest on the part of North Korea right now, and perhaps that is why Foreign Minister Yun is calling for this, uh, for this special envoy. All right, let's, that's, that's excellent on North Korea. Let's pivot a little bit um, to the global and regional issues as befitting the, the name of this panel. Um, both Secretary Crittenbrink and Foreign Minister Yoon, just in his opening uh, intervention, mentioned the values-based diplomacy, right? Victor, this is something you made a long uh, career uh, of, of writing about in academia. Uh, you're, you're a vocal on these issues. And we talk about being guided by principles. Uh, we talk about these sort of universal and global principles. How does that dovetail with the bilateral nature of this relationship between Washington and Seoul. And Seoul that does have unique bilateral components to it, but yet also shares some of these universal values. How are we thinking about the values issues in that context, one, and then two, where are we headed on this bucket of issues? Is this something that is only going to be around for this, this current presidency or maybe a few years and then we might shift, or do you think this is here to stay? Well, I certainly hope it's here to stay. I mean, this, I think, is the natural place where the U.S.-Korea alliance should be. Um, again, in sort of academic writing, I've written about how there are three types of alliances, right? There's alliances that are formed strictly for a military purpose that come apart once the threat the two allies want to address is gone. Um, there are alliances that are, um, that are more institutionalized based on values, where they stand not just against something, but they stand for something. And I think that's where the U.S.-Korea alliance is headed and where it should be headed and where it should be, uh, that's where its permanent home is. I mean, I think there is a, a, a natural and uh, mutually beneficial alignment there. As uh, I think uh, President Lee uh, stated in his remarks this morning, Korea is the 10th largest military in the world. Um, it's one of the most, uh, sorry, 10th largest economy in the world, one of the most capable militaries in the world, uh, a country that is an affluent, industrialized democracy at a time when the liberal international order is being threatened by actions in Europe, uh, by uh, China's assertiveness, by North Korea's missile testing and nuclear testing. And this is when allies need to come together um, and, and play a role, not just providing private goods to each other bilaterally, but providing broader goods for the environment in which they've all grown up and prospered. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. The, I thought this summit was a paradigm shift in that it was not just a focus on military security, which is of course very important, um, but the alliance has gone from a military security alliance to an economic alliance uh, through CHORUS, and now it's an alliance that's focused on sustainability and stability, right? Broader political and economic um, uh, uh, stability and sustainability. And if there's one place where this alliance should be focused going into the future, and we'll talk about this afternoon also in panel three, is it's on supply chains and economic security. Because uh, that ties into everything. It's not just an issue of 
economics. It's an issue of strategy. It's an issue of regional cooperation uh, and support for the, uh, for the rules-based international order. All right, outstanding. Let me go next to Mr. Rapson. Uh, Rob, um, question for you. You've uh, been a practitioner, as your bio uh, suggests or strongly intimates or explicitly states, uh, whatever the case may be. The, the question that I have for you is put yourself back in some of your old, old roles where you were managing bilateral pieces of this relationship. Um, how do you think through management of Washington and Seoul while uh, pushing this new global agenda that is sweeping in nature? How do you prioritize? How do you operationalize? One. And two, your thoughts on the potential of US ROK in terms of a global alliance that tackles global problems together. Rob, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and thanks for the kind intro up front. Thanks to CSIS for having me here today, Korea Foundation as well. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be here in person, you know, one of those rare occasions. And it's also personally great to be here. This is my first public uh, outing mm. since retiring uh, last month from the State Department after 39 years. So if I slip into Diplo speak or government <laughs> babble, I'll give me a little kick on the shins and I'll try to uh, pep it up a little bit. Um, as we heard from Dan, uh, Dan Crittenbrink, as we heard from the Blue House Secretary Wong, I mean, this, the summit was a success in every meaning of the word. Uh, it's two weeks now since the summit, and many analysts have gone through it and have picked apart all the content. And uh, uh, I would agree uh, completely that it's now taking the relationship, it's um, expanding the horizon for cooperation across the board, making it global in nature, uh, while also working some very discrete issues regionally, economically, and all. It's a lifting of the relationship, the framework for lifting the relationship in so many ways. That said, I see some continuity here. Uh, I worked on the summit uh, last year, uh, the summit where President Moon came to Washington, and there was a rather impressive joint statement and a fact sheet that laid out many of the features that we see today, although today now we see an expansion of that universe of opportunity and potential for the Korea-US relationship. Of course, the proof is in the pudding, and implementation and follow-through is essential. Uh, that's hard. Uh, Dr. Yoon, you touched upon that. There, you know, there are distractions throughout the day, the week, the month, uh, on both sides. But if you look at the intention, the commitments embedded in the, uh, in the statements, as well as the words from the presidents themselves, it looks to me that we stand a very good chance, both sides following through on many, if not most, all of the, uh, the commitments that underlie uh, the joint statement. There's always been potential for um, uh, global cooperation. In fact, Korea has been engaged globally in, in so many ways, primarily economically, uh, over the many decades and years that I've been working on Korea. But that's expanded. Uh, Korea's commercial footprint has grown into a development assistant footprint, uh, and now it's looking to match some of that uh, regionally and maybe globally on the strategic side as well. There's great potential, again, for, uh, for Korea to be doing more. What I would go back and also, uh, I know Dan Crittenbrink touched on, and as a practitioner of foreign policy over these many years, it's not easy to put these summits together, and especially uh, when the counterpart has only been in office for 10 days and hadn't quite yet moved into his own office. Uh, uh, to host uh, a visiting U.S. president. But timing is everything, and the timing for this visit was perfect. Uh, I don't recall, and I think it's a first, that uh, a, a sitting U.S. president uh, arrived in Korea so early on in an administration. So kudos to the teams on both sides for the logistics of putting this summit together, but also for making it happen during the time frame it did. I mean, uh, President Yun could have said, hey, I, you know, I'm busy right now. I really can't accommodate President Biden, I've got to take care of a lot of things. I'm just in the office. I'm learning. I don't even have my staff in place yet. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, recognizing the import of doing this and the bilateral summit with the U.S., he welcomed the president. And I think the chemistry, is, uh, as, uh, as Dan described, as uh, you described, Mark, you were there witnessing the, uh, the visit to the uh, Samsung factory, it was all very positive and it augurs uh, very well uh, for the relationship going forward. But, you know, there are, are uh, uh, bad actors out there who uh, are going to test that proposition. And uh, the North Koreans are doing that now, so it'll be interesting to see how this evolves as the new president, President Yun, uh, assumes office and now takes on the heavy mantle of governing and, uh, and leading the country forward. All right, outstanding, Rob. Let me, let me uh, ask you one follow-up question. 
In terms of, I'll just quote uh, Scott Schneider from CFR. Scott made the point uh, a week ago that the fact sheet under Moon Biden felt like the sides were kind of trading off equities, right, and uh, basically accumulating a large fact sheet uh, of full of very interesting deliverables, but were, kind of looked like trade-offs. This one, uh, he said, he thought that it looked a lot more like the two sides were in large agreement and putting down on paper what they had basically agreed to and were going to work together on. So augurs well for implementation, uh, according to Scott. The question that I have for you, to, to come back to Foreign Minister Yoon's uh, comments, is that we've got, and you touched on them too, Rob, we've got this big global agenda, two pretty robust joint statements, fact sheets, whatever you want to call them, from two summits, um, lots to do, and then very, very crowded agenda here in Washington, right? To use Foreign Minister Yoon's list, mm -hmm. I've got China, Ukraine, Iran, domestic political issues. As a practitioner, as someone who, you know, has to basically work in, you know, 12 hours a day, maybe 16 hours a day uh, with the resources you're given, how do you see the bandwidth issue uh, in terms of North Korea, global Korea, the bilateral relationship? Rob, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, bandwidth is an issue. Um, our, uh, our NSC, the State Department, and all the related agencies are consumed with uh, equally, if not more important agendas or urgent agendas at this time. So uh, setting aside that bandwidth to get the essentials done so that there are not big lapses or time goes by uh, where we haven't moved, we haven't been able to meet. But uh, in the first week, two weeks after the summit, we're seeing the principals, the senior officials, U.S. officials, making the time to go out. Wendy Sherman going out. Sung Kim is a regular, frequent traveler uh, to, uh, to Seoul. And we'll just need to see more from the economic agencies. And that's where I think if, uh, if I have uh, any concerns, it would be the bandwidth on the economic security team at state at, and the NSC being able to uh, engage in a robust way with uh, with their Korean counterparts. I don't have any question that on the Korean side uh, that they'll be fully engaged, and uh, President Yoon will make sure that his team is doing all of it all it can to uh, make the uh, the summit outcomes uh, uh, real. No, thanks, Rob. Thanks for that. And I was struck by the the, the secretary's comments about. Um, uh, all the institutional uh, mechanisms that the Koreans are busy standing up on the economic security agenda. It's pretty interesting to deal with the bandwidth issue uh, on their end. So I think your point is, is interesting in terms of our economic agencies watch that space. Perhaps that's for panel uh, three later on this afternoon. All right, uh, Professor Ma, we've kept you on ice for way too long, uh, but, but I did want to set you up in terms of getting through this and bringing you to the strategy question. You are the strategy expert here uh, up on the, the, the stage. And the question that I have for you is thinking through your old hat uh, or your old job uh, at, the, at the Blue House, rather, where you're, you're charged with compiling all of this and basically prioritizing uh, and formulating a strategy that is workable for the bilateral relationship. How do you see this? We've talked about all of the global issues. We've talked about bandwidth issues. We've talked about DPRK and the Korean Peninsula issues. If you're thinking through now, coming off of this summit, two leaders, great chemistry, big list of things to do, how do we formulate this into a coherent, co uh, cohesive strategy? between the two allies that effectively prioritizes this vast problem set and then allows for effective and efficient implementation. Professor Ma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me and a uh, very interesting and very uh, daunting question uh, to answer. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, summit was a uh, success as all the participants uh, just uh, mentioned. But at the same time, there are some uh, areas to be discussed further in the uh, later time. Uh, I think uh, the priority question is number one question that we have to answer. But uh, with just regarding uh, the uh, North Korean denuclearization question, I think uh, uh, the, the, que the question itself was not much addressed uh, in the summit and in the joint statement. And uh, addressing the denuclearization of North Korea or the Korean Peninsula itself actually uh, quite 
tightly linked to the regional issue, regional uh, uh, politics, uh, especially the U.S.-China uh, competition directly affects uh, how China uh, views uh, North Korea, uh, the value of the strategic uh, value of the North Korea. Uh, in, uh, as we all know, uh, back in 2017, China agrees to the uh, passing the uh, UN Security Resolution on uh, posing uh, new sanctions on North Korea. Uh, but now China opposes every uh, steps that the uh, US and, and South Korea would like to uh, you know, put on the, new, uh, the UN agenda. So uh, the, in the background, uh, US-China relationship and the regional affairs and how Korea uh, tried to, uh, can I say, uh, went on, on, the, on, on that terrain uh, directly affects uh, the denuclearization question. I wonder uh, whether our uh, government or the American government uh, actually are thinking and, and planning on that uh, very difficult question and a very sensitive question as well, especially because uh, regional and uh, Korean Peninsula uh, are very uh, tightly uh, linked. So well, in, when we uh, start uh, thinking about strategy, we, we, we have to uh, take uh, into consideration of those uh, two domains at the same time. Excellent. And let's, let's tease you out a little bit. Let's draw you out a little bit on the question of China and broaden it a little bit away from North Korea, right? Obviously, you really uh, outlined the issue well in terms of there's this complicated geopolitical issue that has a direct impact on North Korea. One could argue that there's a complicated geopolitical relationship between Washington and Beijing that impacts the region, if not the world. Um, your thoughts in terms of where the Republic of Korea sits in this mix, right, in terms of the U.S.-China question. I know this is a, a big question in the Republic of Korea. Where does it sit and what did you see from the summit in terms of the direction that the alliance is heading on the China issue writ large? Well, it is quite clear that uh, the United States, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Republic of Korea uh, is taking more, uh, you know, stronger relationship with the United States. Uh, and, uh, well, the wish to uh, strengthen the alliance is uh, very much uh, vivid in the uh, joint statement. But at the same time, we, we cannot uh, miss the, uh, the point that uh, uh, the joint statement was very much uh, careful uh, in somehow avoid, avoid, trying to avoid uh, the sentences or phrases uh, that might, you know, uh, somehow provoke Chinese uh, uh, sentiment. So, well, it was a very well carefully written uh, statement, I think. Uh, so, in that regard, uh, Korea, and even in our uh, previous uh, speech by the uh, Secretary Wang, he he mentioned that uh, Korea still wants to preserve its. Uh, uh, cooperative relations with China, especially in terms of uh, economic relations. So I think, uh, well, we, we may have to be careful. Korea is not really taking a very clear side, uh, but at the same time, Korea was want, wanting to and still wants to uh, strengthen uh, its alliance relation with the United States. Okay, one more follow-up to you, then I'm going to come back to Foreign Minister Yoon. Um, if you were back, Professor Ma, um, and Foreign Minister, you can get ready because I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, first of all, if you were back in your job at the Blue House, now Yongsan, and it's late at night and the president calls you and says, what should we, be th what should we do about China? Where, where should we be headed? Um, what would your answer be? Well, we'd like to uh, gradually uh, well, decouple or you know, separate our uh, economic relations with China, but I think uh, it will take very long time. But we have to give a clear signal to our companies and corporations. Uh, well, try not, you know, invest too much in, in that country and try to uh, take an alternative ways to uh, conduct their business with other countries. Uh, but because it will take, um, taking, it will take a uh, very long time, uh, the process has to be very gradual. So in the meantime, we have to maintain 
you know, uh, somewhat uh, cooperative relations with Chinese with the leadership. That's, uh, you, know, you know, inevitable. All right, excellent. Thanks, Professor. Foreign Minister Yoon, questions, same qu set of questions to you. Question one is your analysis of the direction of the U.S. ROK alliance vis-a-vis -vis China, and two, your recommendations on where we should be heading uh, as an alliance uh, with respect to China. The big regional and global question, I would say, one of the big <gasps> regional and global questions at the heart of Washington and Seoul uh, relations. Over to you, Foreign Minister. I think the fact that uh, President Yoon Seok Yeo uh, agreed on the uh, 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 on the contents of joint statement, which uh, emphasized the importance of value as a guideline of alliance, has uh, already made the position of Korean government clear uh, in terms of its relationship with China. Uh, what I'm saying is. Uh, the relationship between the United States and China, uh, United States and uh, ROK is qualitatively different from our relationship with China in the sense that we share common values with the United States and we are allies uh, for seven decades. And uh, our relationship with China is different from that kind of, uh, I mean, alliance relationship. So. We need to make it uh, clear, um, uh, I mean, quietly to the top leaders of uh, China, and uh, that will uh, make a bilateral relationship between Korea and South Korea and China uh, probably more stable from a long-term perspective, uh, because it uh, may w reduce the kind of, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, over uh, e expectations about uh, what South Korea can do to China or uh, cannot do, something like that. So uh, I think uh, our relationship with uh, China, I mean, our okay China relationship should be based on, uh, uh, based on common understanding of mutual interest. And uh, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Rule-based international order, uh, something like uh, I mean, respect for sovereignty and uh, mutual understanding uh, about uh, each country's interest, or something like that. So I think uh, it's, it's uh, qualitatively different. I mean, from uh, uh, our relationship with the United States. Uh, so. I think that uh, should work as a guideline for Korea's diplomacy. And uh, one, one important thing is that our government or political leaders sometimes should be ready to uh, and kind of uh, I mean, face some uh, protest or some difficulties coming from China. Uh, but I think even in that kind of uh, situations, uh, Korean leaders uh, tend to uh, should uh, behave kind of with some principle, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's the kind of uh, wise way of doing diplomacy with Chinese people, I think. And the principles uh, that you would like to see followed when Korean leaders face uh, protests or demarches from the Chinese side are, what, what principles would you like to see in there? Uh, for example, we can explain to them that uh, our constitution defines Korea as a democratic state. So it is natural for South Korea to go together with the United States when they promote democracy in the world. I mean, that kind of uh, I mean, uh, clear positioning is important uh, to when we explain our situation uh, to, to Chinese people. Uh, but our relationship with China, uh, I mean, uh, we remain uh, stable and uh, mutually beneficial uh, if uh, we, I mean, they understand our position clearly and uh, if they respect, I mean, their own interest uh, in their relationship with South Korea. So I think that's the, that should be the basic guideline with, uh, I mean, diplomacy with, with China. 
Got it. Thanks for the expert uh, commentary there, Foreign Minister. Uh, Rob, over to you. Then I'm going to come to Victor. Then we're going to open up for questions because we're starting to get a little short on time. But Rob, uh, let's let's vector a little different uh, direction in terms of the region. Um, two areas where you have served, right? Japan, which we're going to do a whole panel on later, but would be interested in your thoughts there. But also Southeast Asia, where you have deep uh, experience as well. How should the U.S. ROK alliance be thinking about those two regions uh, in terms of where we can cooperate? our alignment, our posture in terms of uh, mm -hmm. effectuating a more regional and global outlook yeah. between Washington and Seoul? No, good questions and good points, Mark. If I can just go back to China just for two seconds. Yeah, please. Um, you know, the flashpoint for there, the We have a rule here. If you don't like the question, you just no, make I do up like a the question. question. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's a good it's question. Good. And I, I, won't, I won't hang around China too long. Um, the, the flashpoint, of course, for the last administration, uh, the Moon administration, even for the Pak uh, Gane administration, was the THAAD deployment, mm -hmm. the flashpoint with China which precipitated you know, the actions that we're well familiar mm -hmm. with, uh, the costs that were uh, put on Korean companies. And some of those costs are still, still out there. Mm -hmm. um, it begs the question, you know, what is that? Is there another flashpoint out there or trigger point with China that could mm -hmm. precipitate uh, coercive measures of some sort? Don't know. Uh, maybe, hopefully, we won't have to find out. And then, of course, for the US, the big question, I think this is part of the IPEF framework discussion, is what do we do to help allies and partners who come under the bite of, uh, mm. of Beijing like this in a coercive way? Mm. Uh, and that's something that needs to be talked about, thought through, because I think the feeling in Korea was that they bore the brunt, Korea bore the brunt of uh, Beijing's coercive measures without any assistance or support uh, from mm. elsewhere. Um, but Southeast Asia is, is a win-win region. Uh, and the Koreans bring a lot to the table already through their trade, investment, uh, ODA. Uh, and what we can do, what we've been trying to do uh, to date, but can do more of it, is greater coordination, finding synergies uh, bilaterally, multilaterally with other partners in the region to bring Korean expertise, <coughs> Korean money to bear uh, in capacity building across the board. Uh, Korea has been you know, that model for so many countries out there. Uh, the miracle in the Han has resonance. And uh, so uh, just doing a lot more of what we have been doing, and I think there's a willingness on the Korean government's part to invest even more in the region. And they can, you know, they can take that into the strategic realm as well. Uh, they've been doing some already through surplus uh, uh, assets, military assets that have been provided to some countries. They're uh, you know, working uh, uh, closely with Vietnam and others uh, to, to, uh, to build up their uh, abilities. Of course, ASEAN's not a homogeneous entity. It has members that have different interests and different, different connections. And the third piece, I, I served in uh, the other country that uh, features heavily now in, in Indo-Pacific discussions in India. I was in India for three years. Um, and and the, the, the India is a special case, uh, and the Koreans have been invested there in a long, uh, for a long time, but I think there's more that can be done there. And of course, if Korea aspires to Quad status or a, a stronger relationship with Quad, uh, India's thoughts and role are very important in that regard. No, well put, Rob. And I would say a couple of just go-backs. One, when I was ambassador, the Indian relationship was uh, getting um, warmer w between the two sides bilateral. I think we had two or three ship visits. We had, uh, I think, six or seven different ministers come through. I mean, it was pretty remarkable. In large part, it was a response to that, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. And on the that point, I'll just make one comment, which is interesting in terms of public support for THAAD has always been so durable in Korea, despite all of this, right? It's been strong, well over 50 percent, sometimes going all the way into the 70 percent. It seems though the Korean people have a very clear-eyed view and have really told their uh, leaders what their preference is. And it comes back to uh, Foreign Minister Yoon's comments about democracy being enshrined in the Korean constitution, right? So it's not an insignificant piece of data that there's strong, robust, and durable public support, especially among the young generation for that and uh, the moves along the line. So pretty interesting stuff, Rob, that you've teased out. So thanks for that. Please and come back. Just 20 seconds Please. going back to Professor Ma's point, uh, divesting from China's hard for companies, not just Korean companies, but American companies, European companies. The market is so large, the supply chains are so intertwined that you're right, it's going to take a long time if that effort's going to be successful. Korean companies, I've talked with them uh, over the years, and they all want to divest in some fashion 
uh, move, uh, move their investments elsewhere. Vietnam is a, is a nice location, but it has limits, capacity limits on how much investment it can take. So what's the next big market or markets out there? Some reside in ASEAN, but they're small. India, the potential's always there. The reality sometimes falls short. Um, so not an, easy, uh, not an easy problem to resolve. Best of intentions, but in practice, it's hard to divest completely and decouple, decouple from China. And final point, Rob, just to pick up on your piece on economic retaliation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the U.S. Congress has asked the administration for a study or a report on what to do about these issues. So some pretty interesting uh, thoughts and activities swirling around that as well. Um, all right, uh, Victor, final word to you. Uh, comments, before we open it up to questions, comments on any of the issues. Good back and forth here. Um, in terms of, especially in terms of uh, values, especially in terms of China, Japan, uh, all of that good stuff. But where are we headed in terms of globalizing and or regionalizing uh, this relationship between uh, Korea and the United States? So, so just on the, on the China piece of this, I think, um, uh, I think Rob's right. I mean, the, the notion of completely decoupling from China is difficult for any country to consider. Um, but I don't think that's really the answer for Korea, right? It's not, it's not the notion of decoupling, but it, it is the notion of trying to be able to deter future efforts by China to, to weaponize inter the, inter interdependence the way they did in 2017. And, and that is not something that Korea can do on its own, right? It has to do that in cooperation with other countries that are also subject to China's efforts to economically coerce. So um, um, our good friend Bonnie Glazer has come up with a term for this. She calls it collective resilience, right? Um, and maybe whether that's through IPEF or through other sorts of formations, it's trilateral with Japan, uh, finding ways of coming together to have countermeasures uh, uh, ready uh, that could be triggered if China again tries to do what they did to Korea in 2017, 2016, 2017, with regard to that. Does that take time? Of course it does, and that's why I think the point that uh, Professor Maud made is important. Like, we need time to do things like this. We need time to organize uh, governments around this, to organize private sector around this. Um, but it is a shift in the way we think about these things. Um, and, and this idea of collective resilience, I think, is one of the ways to think about deterring future Chinese action. Not decoupling from China, but deterring future Chinese action. Um, and then the second point I wanted to make, and you referenced it early, at the very beginning, Mark, is, um, is I think a, you know, an important test for the new Yun government when it comes to global Korea will be uh, what else it will do with regard to the war in Europe. Um, uh, you know, Korea's, uh, Korea's been invited along with Japan, Australia, and New Zealand to the NATO summit in, in, uh, next month in Spain. Um, you know, I think that's a real showcase for President Yun and his administration to really put, um, uh, to, to walk the walk in terms of global Korea. Are you holding to your prediction made on the Capitol cable that there will be a big splashed yes. by the Korean government at the NATO summit. Yes, yes. Okay, we're just, holding you to it. Yes, mm -hmm. just like I was incorrect in terms of my prediction about North Korea doing a nuclear test during Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> um, but I think that this is, it, it's so an important test. We're gonna short test. you on North Korea, but go okay. long on the NATO summit. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, got but it. it. But if, if, uh, if Korea truly wants to be a, a global pivot player, in terms of international stability, this is the most important thing that's happening mm -hmm. in the world today that involves Korea's stakes uh, as an important supporter of the, of the rules-based international order. So. All right, excellent. Uh, Victor, and I know I said this would be the last question, but I'm gonna go back one more time to Professor Ma because um, both the previous panelists mentioned his intervention, and I think it did get the creative juices flowing um, in, in a really interesting way. Let's go back to this notion on how to deal with China, right? You've got Korean companies, you've got um, Korean government policy, you've got the U.S., you've got other markets, all of this, and you've got Victor's concept that he brought in uh, uh, from, via Bonnie Glazer, um, our former colleague here, of collective resilience. How are you thinking in terms of strategy, the right mix of public, 
versus private, right? You've got market forces, some very, very hard business decisions that have to be made by not just Korean companies, but as Rob pointed out, multinationals on the one hand. On the other hand, you've got industrial policy um, in more focus here in the United States than it's ever been, but it's also yeah. extant uh, for, it's been extant rather for many decades in Asia, right, in a different way. And then you've got government high foreign policy going on in the background. How do, what's the right mix here of, of these things uh, in terms of how do, how do leaders in both capitals and business leaders and academics think through this basket of issues? Small little question to you, Professor Mont, to round out the panel. Uh, I don't have uh, well, private sector uh, experience, so I, I'm not sure uh, I'm not the right person to answer <laughs> that uh, very important question. But I think, uh, well, in the previous administration, for example, in, in Korea, Korean companies are complaining that, uh, well, we don't know what's the direction that we are heading. So they were complaining why, why government uh, giving us a uh, direction, even if uh, the, the specific answers to a specific question uh, on the business side. So, well, government has to uh, think up uh, very uh, hard and uh, at least uh, provide some uh, directions that our uh, government's foreign policy is heading and our relationship with uh, both uh, China and the United States is being uh, directed, then I'm, I'm sure uh, our uh, very capable businessmen will find their own answer. Okay, thanks. Foreign Minister Yoon, do you want to uh, answer or address any of that, uh, that intervention and or the question in terms of how do you think through policy, government, market economics, business, uh, cultural relations as well? I think the most important thing that uh, our government should do is uh, to send a right signal to the private sector so that they can uh, predict uh, I mean, what kind of uh, I mean, the, uh, policies will come from uh, our government and uh, uh, how they should readjust their business strategy in accordance to that kind of uh, uh, I mean, uh, government policies. Important thing is that top policy makers uh, should make a very uh, correct kind of uh, I mean, policy uh, based on our uh, core judgment of uh, international situation surrounding Korean Peninsula. And uh, I think that's important. And I recently heard that uh, big businesses began to increase their investment in South Korea in recent weeks. I think that, uh, I mean, has some implication for the importance of uh, a right government policy choices. All right, outstanding. Let's end the panel there in terms of the panelist uh, contributions and interventions to my questions. Now it's, the floor is open uh, to anyone who may want to ask uh, questions for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, if, if not, we'll go to lunch early, maybe? I, I don't know. I don't so, know. Oh, there's are, a video. Are we doing questions online, too? We're not doing questions online. Okay. Um, so while they're waiting, can I just say on your last question, Mark, about, you know, government signal? I mean, yeah. you know, government can signal very clearly, as you know well. They can signal very clearly in terms of uh, what direction they are moving, and they can not just signal, but they can provide incentives. Right. right for companies, and there's nothing that makes companies res respond more than incentives, whether it's in, you know in, in industrial policy or in tax policy. So there are clearly ways to signal directions, even for Korean companies, which are notoriously known for not <laughs> necessarily following what the government government wants to do. So um, so I think there is a I think there is a way forward here here on this, um, and uh, um, and, and I think you know the. The administration has an the, the UN administration ha, has an opportunity to do this um, uh, since it's sort of already laid out how important these issues are very early on in the administration. And just tell me if if this I'm just going to follow up, Victor, on your comment here. It does seem that it is a 
complicated mix that we are entering into in this relationship, right? We are broadening it in terms of its scope, in terms of the issue set, right? It's, it's, it's been broadening for a while, but you would say probably that, that breadth is accelerating, yeah. right? Number one. Number two, the, I guess you would say the geographic reach is also enhancing at the same time or expanding too. And three, I would say the issue sets are becoming even more complicated, mm -hmm. right, in terms of that. So sitting back at your old desk at the NSC, you know, Steve Hadley's calling you, uh, you know, how are you thinking through what needs to get done first in this really matrixed yeah. relationship that we find ourselves in? So I, I would say, and, and not to sort of uh, steal the thunder from this afternoon's panel on, on, on economic security and supply chains, I'm seeing them all sitting right in front of us. <laughs> I mean, if I had to pick one, you know, obviously North Korea can present itself as a proximate issue at any moment. At any moment, they could do that. But thinking in sort of the medium to long term, I would say it really is about economic resilience and supply chain security because that is connected to the China issue, mm -hmm. right? It is connected to cooperation with Japan. It's connected to investment in the United States. It's connected to everything. So, um, you know, we had the um, uh, presidential secretary for economic security doing the keynote this morning. My hope is that he is and I don't know if he is, he is fully staffed up uh, with, uh, with folks from different ministries that are reporting to him uh, and that there is a direct counterpart for him in our, in our government, the NSC, because if I had to choose one, it would, it would be that, because I think it reverberates, you know, onto questions of how willing uh, South Korea is to be more vocal on Taiwan, for example, or how willing it is to, uh, say more about freedom of navigation. Even though those are not supply chain security issues, they can certainly link to those issues um, if, uh, if the concern is, is Chinese economic coercion. Yeah, and then one, one quick follow to that, back to you, Victor. Sorry, just to, um, it dovetails with what Rob said earlier, right? Um, in that we've got these economic agencies um, in the U.S. that traditionally haven't played this role. Right. right? Mm -hmm. This is newish territory for the United States. I mean, we've run industrial policy in the U.S. We've mainly run it out of the Pentagon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see the AFN commercials, Rob knows them well, of the Pentagon inventing the microwave, right? And uh, <laughs> these, you know, the Pentagon would develop uh, technology, and Ash Carter's book talks a lot about it. They would develop technology, kind of hold it, and then d disperse it, right? Mm -hmm. We're in a very different model now where it's much more commercially available. The business community has to be invested. So we've got a different landscape using different agencies in the U.S. government that probably haven't played as big of a role in the U.S. ROK relationship. The Pentagon is well established. You could argue the trade ministries are well established. I see our uh, former Korean former ambassador to the WTO. That that infrastructure is there. The State Department, as Rob pointed out, lots of activity there. That's well established. This is newish, and in the fact or in the joint statement, we've got a new commercial dialogue, right, on supply chain. We've got this NSC dialogue. This is all new stuff. So it sounds like to me, Victor, tell me if I'm wrong, getting um, the infrastructure and structure up and running from being fully staffed to figuring out how the two sides are going to work with each other is also going to be of paramount importance. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Rob, please, come on in. No, I'm just going to go back to this issue of globalism versus regionalism, and not to be glib here, but the region is going to demand and command attention. And if Korea can get the regional pieces right, starting with Japan, and if Japan can get the regional piece with Korea right, a lot will follow from that for the opportunities for cooperation in IPEF, I think, will be greater if there's resonance with, between Tokyo and Seoul, or greater resonance between Tokyo and Seoul. The China piece is always there. And Southeast Asia, you know, hanging, the, the low-hanging fruit for opportunity for Japan and Korea to work together with us and others to uh, promote these values uh, that we were talking about so much. So global, great, but I think the region still, the basics in the region need immediate attention from the administrations. No, very fair in, in terms of, especially in terms of you look proximate to Seoul, you've got nuclear weapons issues, you've got massive economic uh, security and more traditional economic issues. I mean, the region, uh, is 
driving uh, many of these global discussions uh, as well. So it's well put there. Um, all right, so we're at 11.30. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions. We have about five minutes left. Um, so Victor, I'm gonna ask you to, to just uh, try to wrap up the, uh, the panel here in terms of main conclusions, main summary, main takeaway, and set us up for uh, the following sessions here today. So, I mean, the, the only, I'll add a couple, I'm sure everybody else has some comments too, but I'll, yeah. I'll just add that. Um, yeah, I should say I'm coming to the rest of the panelists too. I didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna go down the line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not filibuster for five minutes. Right, okay. yeah. Not tap dance for five yeah. minutes. Um, so I, so I would, the, the one thing I would say about the, the Alliance, since the panel is about the Alliance is, um, you know, I think that the things that are different now are that, um, as you mentioned earlier, Scott talked about how uh, the joint statement didn't feel transactional, right? And I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, and, and, and Rob probably knows this well. I'm sure Foreign Minister Yun knows this well. In the past, sometimes the alliance um, became very transactional. It's like, you know, I'll do this if you do this, right? And, and the joint statements of fact sheet started to look like that. There was no fact sheet for this particular summit just because it was only 10 days after the new government had started. But it doesn't feel like that, right? It feels very different. And that links to my, and that's because there's a common foundation in values and values-based diplomacy and uh, supporting the, the norms-based international order. And that, that relates to the second point, which is um, trust, right? Um, that whether you're talking about extended deterrence or whether you're talking about supply chain security, the element of trust in sort of alliance politics is much more central mm. than it was in the past. I mean, if you just talk about an alliance based on transactions, there's not a lot of trust there. It's just like, you do this, I'll do this. We'll coordinate it. But when we're talking about extended deterrence and supply chain resilience, um, the trust becomes a much more important factor, and I think that is something that um, both sides have been have working to cultivate in the alliance relationship going forward. All right, Foreign Minister, you in closing comments to you. I agree with Victor. Uh, I mean, the trust factor is uh, most important. And uh, in that regard, I, I was happy to hear President Biden saying, I trust you to mm -hmm. President uh, Yoon suk yeol when he departed Seoul. So I think um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of our alliance. Let me stop there. All right, Rob. I think the relationship between the two administrations has gotten off to a great start. A foundational document is in place that lays the pathway forward. Um, but the best of plans, of course, will be tested uh, by these outside forces and actors. Uh, uh, the new Korean administration has only been in place for a month. You know, so it's got a, a long, maybe a sharp learning curve as it settles into governing. So we'll have to watch that space carefully. And of course, domestic politics here in the U.S. Uh, will assert themselves later this year and may have impacts on, you know, on how we conduct our foreign policy in some respects. So again, those X factors uh, are out there and uh, we'll need to be cognizant and watch those spaces very carefully. All right, outstanding. All right, uh, Professor Ma, last word to you. Right. Uh, we, well, the tone setting between the two allies has been very successful, and we need uh, further discussions about uh, how to implement the, uh, the uh, extended deterrence, for example. Uh, the, the United States seems to uh, put uh, emphasis on integrated uh, deterrence, uh, which uh, uh, encompass uh, not only the nuclear deterrence, but also other means to deter North Korean threats, while South Korea seems to more, more focused on how to share nuclear weapons with the United, United States and some more direct, uh, you know, uh, measures. But uh, we need to figure out, I think, uh, in the future. Uh, and, 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 and also, uh, South Korea seems to be more inclined to uh, somehow engage uh, North Korea in, the, in China, perhaps, then the United States. So uh, even though we are putting in a, a similar direction, but there are some uh, ch uh, differences in degree, uh, and uh, we, need, we need to figure out how will be the, our uh, you know, common uh, strategy in the future. 
All right, outstanding. We're going to leave it there. Professor Ma, Mr. Repson, Foreign Minister Yoon, Dr. Cha, thank you. Outstanding panel. Got us off to a fabulous start uh, throughout the day here for setting up panels two and three well, and we are looking forward to a great day of uh, discussion and dialogue on a critical set of issues. Again, thank you uh, to the panelists. Big round of applause, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.
Good morning. My name is uh, Yong Kwan Yun, and uh, it, it is my uh, great honor uh, to uh, chair this panel on uh, improving uh, South Korea Japan relationship. And we had a very productive discussion uh, this morning uh, in session one. Uh, and one of the most important issues related to the topic we discussed in the previous session is the relationship between Japan and South Korea. Uh, as, we all, as we all know, both countries share uh, I mean, democracy and market system, and uh, uh, we also uh, face common uh, security stress coming from North Korea and some other uh, uh, countries. And I think it is important to improve a bilateral relationship between two countries. Also, both countries are allies of the United States. In some sense, uh, when we confront a North Korean uh, security threat, uh, South Korea, if South Korea is a, a, a forward base, I think Japan is a real base. And it is uh, kind of unreasonable to see the relationship between those two bases are uh, not working well. So uh, I think uh, how to improve uh, Japan and ROK, ROK and Japan relationship uh, in the future, that's an important subject. As we know, uh, bilateral relationship between uh, ROK and Japan uh, hit the lowest point in the recent uh, few years, uh, probably mainly because of uh, some history issues. And uh, today's topic, I mean, this, uh, the topic for this panel's discussion is uh, how to fix the problem and how we can improve the relationship between two big uh, country, uh, two, uh, two, two uh, countries. And President Yoon Suk Yeol made it clear that his policy is to improving bilateral relationship uh, between uh, South Korea and Japan. And uh, uh, he also said that uh, he would uh, reinvigorate uh, 1998 uh, Kim Dae-jung Obuchi Declaration. And I sincerely hope that his goal can be achieved uh, in, in coming years. And to discuss uh, this uh, important topic, we have uh, four distinguished uh, panelists uh, today. And first, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheila Smith uh, is participating uh, uh, through Zoom. And let me briefly introduce her to you. Uh, Dr. Smith is John E. Morrow Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Studies uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she is an expert on Japanese politics and foreign policy. And she is the author of Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power, Intimate Rivals. Uh, Japanese uh, domestic politics and the rising China, and Japan's new politics and the US-Japan alliance. She is also the author of the CFR Interactive Guide, Constitutional Change in Japan. Uh, Dr. Smith is a regular contributor to the CFR blog, Asia Unbound, and a frequent contributor to major media outlets in the United States and Asia. Uh, she was a visiting scholar at Keio University in 2007 to 2008, and there she researched Japan's foreign policy toward China, and uh, it was supported by Abe Fellowship. Uh, Dr. Smith is uh, also chair of the Japan-US Friendship Commission, 
and the U.S. advisors to the U.S.-Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange. Uh, she teaches as an adjunct professor at the Asian Studies uh, Department of Asian Studies Department of Georgetown University. Uh, she got his P, uh, her PhD degree from uh, Columbia University. Next to my uh, to my left, uh, Dr. Uh, Yeol Son. Uh, Professor Son is the president of East Asia Institute, a think tank in Korea, and he is a professor of Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University. Dr. Son is the uh, uh, professor uh, uh, in the uh, Yonsei University, and uh, he served as president of the Korean Association of International Studies in 2019, and also as dean of GSIS from 2012 to 2016. Uh, Dr. Son taught at Jungang University and University of Tokyo and was visiting scholar uh, uh, visiting scholar at institutions in the University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill and also University of California Berkeley. He was also a senior fellow of the Fulbright, Fulbright Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Foundation, Japan Foundation, and Waseda University's Institute for Advanced St Studies. Uh, he served as policy advisors on a number of government advisory committees, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Industry and Trade, uh, etc. Uh, and he has many publications, uh, including a, a, a publication, uh, some uh, title is Japan and Asia's uh, Contested Order. Uh, co-authored with uh, Dr. T.J. Pempel in 2019. Okay, then uh, to his left, uh, uh, Dr. Eunbong Che, she is Professor of Political Science and Diplomacy uh, of Iwa Women's University. Uh, Dr. Che is Professor in the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at Iwa Women's University and the director of the Iwa Institute of Politics. Uh, she received her doctoral degree from Ohio State University in 1991. And uh, uh, she previously served as assistant professor and associate professor uh, uh, at Kangwon National University and a, a visiting research fellow at the University of Tsukuba, Japan. Uh, he, she has numerous publications in the fields of Japanese politics, the East Asian region, and comparative politics. And also she has served as president of Korean Association of Contemporary Japanese Studies uh, in Korea, and also served as uh, vice president of the Korea Political Science Association and Korean International Political Science Association. She also served as the Dean of College of Social Sciences, uh, Iwa Women's University. And, and to her uh, left, uh, Dr. Ellen Kim, and uh, she is Deputy Director and Senior Fellow uh, of Korea Chair at CSIS. Uh, and her research focuses on U.S.-Korea relations and U.S.-China strategy competition in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, she joined the Korea chair upon uh, its inception in 2009 and previously served as associate director and fellow before her departure in 2015. Uh, her recent publications include uh, North Korea Without Change, uh, co-authored uh, with uh, Victor Cha, and uh, between rock and a hard place, South Korea's strategic dilemma with China and the United States uh, in 2016. And she holds uh, his, uh, her PhD uh, in political science from the University of uh, South, uh, Cali Southern California and master's degree from Kennedy School of uh, Harvard University 
and uh, her, uh, uh, she got a BA degree in international relations from Wellesley College. So we have uh, a wonderful I mean, panelist here uh, to discuss uh, this important topic. And uh, I'd like to give you probably about f five minutes uh, to discuss this topic. Uh, and uh, please, uh, Dr. Smith, please go first. Thank you very much. Is it okay? Can we hear? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I hear an echo. In the back. Um, I apologize for not being there in person. I so wanted to be with you all, but um, we are still living in the world of COVID, and so I have to be isolated a bit. Um, I wanted to say, uh, President Lee, uh, Korea Foundation. It's a. Uh, I'm sorry that I won't get a chance to see you, but and thank you, Victor and CSIS, for including me. Foreign Minister Yoon and, uh, Moon and I had a chance earlier, a few weeks ago, to talk. A little bit about these issues and I, I have a couple of very basic points to make about the trilateral relationship and within it obviously uh, the more uh, complex Japan South Korea relationship you know we, we are not in the same moment uh, as 1998 and yet I think that President Yoon's endorsement of the Obuch Kim uh, joint statement was very positive because it sent a message I think of the kind of relationship that he would like to build again with Japan. I think we're in a moment of, of confidence building for the Japan-Korea relationship. And I think in both sides, uh, the publics will scrutinize uh, what the new administration in Seoul and what the, with the Kichita cabinet is able to do. So I think it's important that we recognize what's changed a little bit since 1998. I think the domestic political changes obviously are the most, uh, most important indicator. Um, there are longstanding issues that are sensitive and they always have been. And I think what's what's important here is to recognize that there's a domestic audience and there is perhaps a, a more serious scrutiny now of some of the steps um, that will need to be taken. I think the other issues so were brought up in the previous by the previous speakers and the previous panel in particular, and that is uh, we need to be realistic, I think, about our expectations. The world is changing and changing very quickly. And I think that also means that the stakes are higher for Japan and South Korea and the United States to try to get this relationship uh, on a more positive footing. We can be slow and steady in the way we approach it, but we could also recognize where some of this accelerated geostrategic change offers perhaps new opportunities. And these came up, I think, in our previous panel. Um, sustaining the liberal order today is not something that any of us can take for granted. And I think that that for, uh, is an opportunity, I think, for us, three the three countries that we're discussing this morning. Um, China often uh, is something that we often hear diplomats and statesmen in either Tokyo or Seoul, perhaps speaking in a different, slightly different tone because of their different opportunities and their different ways of approaching the problem. But I think we are at a moment where we can recognize some of the specific challenges that we all face and we all have faced uh, in terms of dealing with China. Um, so I think we are a little bit more, uh, it, there is more opportunity here, given that we have the same strategic concerns about the changing balance of power in the Indo-Pacific and indeed globally. Uh, I think therefore there's some constants in the, in the bilateral Japan-South Korea relationship. There's some constants even in our trilateral relationship, but there's also I think opportunity for reframing the way we think about uh, our, our partnerships. So I had a couple of um, issues that I had written about a few weeks ago for the Wilson Center, but I think the, the most important one, of course, as we look at North Korea's recent behavior is to make sure that we are frank with each other about what deterrence looks like. And again, I think I too was very happy with the summit meeting that President Biden had with President Yoon. It was a very positive statement of that, uh, extent, not only extended deterrence, but also the willingness of the two leaders to make sure that there is no miscalculation or there should be no miscalculation. Now I think the time, it's time to build Japan into that mix. So I hear uh, in the trilateral US-Japan ROK relationship, hope that we can work towards a, a moment where there's 
greater exercise and greater demonstration of the willingness of these two alliances to combine capabilities and to be able to be ready should it become necessary uh, to act on the, on the need for uh, extended deterrence and the deterrence more broadly. On the economic side of things, this is where previous speakers have already made their, their points as well, and there's going to be a whole panel discussion, so I won't labor, belabor this point, but it's clear to me that um, all three of us, United States, Japan, and the ROK, need to elevate economic security in the way we think about our alliance structure and our priorities. And I'm delighted to see that this is something that uh, President Yoon and his administration also feels very strongly about. This can be done, obviously, in various venues. And again, this has already been discussed. The supply chain resilience issue has been a prior is a priority. But I wouldn't. Uh, I would also put a second issue up on the table here for consideration, and that is the future of technological innovation. Uh, we can't be benign, I think, about how, the kinds of challenges ahead. And this is something where Japan, Korea, and the United States perhaps can begin to think about what it is they can do together to ensure that technology is protected, but also that we are working on the same pathways towards innovation. Let me just briefly mention two other things for Minister Yoon, and then I'll turn it back to you. Um, one is, of course, on the on the very difficult question of historical legacy issues. It seems to me that we, Japan and South Korea, got very narrow in the way they construed the, the venues through which they could consider these issues uh, over the last several years. And I would very much like to see a broadening. I don't see the United States here as having a direct role, but as it is supporting or facilitating role, should we be asked uh, for it. But I think it's really important to understand that reconciliation is a process that is not just accomplished by statesmen and diplomats, by state leaders. It also has to be embraced by civil society and private sector leaders as well. And I am quite hopeful that the private sector in both Japan and South Korea uh, can come into this conversation and offer some constructive pathways forward. Finally, I think, and this is an obvious point, and I will make it simply because it's an area that I work on in the U.S.-Japan partnership, but we really need to invest in our next generation. And I think there's, a, there's lots of opportunity here for investment, not only in bilateral next generation uh, efforts, but also perhaps trilateral. The younger people in the United States, Japan, and South Korea really do have different ideas about the opportunities of this partnership. And I think we'd be behoove us to invest a little bit on creating opportunities for them also to contribute to a, to the U.S.-Japan-South Korean relationship more broadly. So with that, let me stop here, Minister Yoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful, excellent uh, comments. And uh, when you emphasize the importance of educating young people, uh, I fully agree as a person who taught at university for a long time and uh, I think that's certainly a very important subject. Uh, also, let me ask, I mean, as you mentioned, the situation has changed a lot uh, since 1998, uh, Kim Dae-jung, Obuchi uh, declaration. Uh, but at that time, around 1997, 1996, I still remember there were strong uh, domestic political uh, opposition against I mean, Kim Dae-jung or any political leader's uh, possible I mean, uh, policy of approaching to I mean, Japan, improving uh, I mean, uh, bilateral relationship or something like that. But he was very I mean, uh, kind of uh, strong in uh, his view about uh, the desirability of improving bilateral relationship. Uh, uh, and could you, uh, I mean, uh, draw some, what kind of, uh, I mean, uh, what kind of lessons we can draw from uh, Prime Minister Obuchi at that time and Prime Minister Kim Dae, I mean, uh, uh, President Kim Dae-jung in 1998? Uh, is there anything they can uh, teach for their uh, I mean, predecessors, I mean, I mean successors like uh, Yoon suk yeol and uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida and President uh, Yoon suk yeol Oh, excellent question. Thank you for that. I, I was in Japan at the time that President Kim visited, and I was amazed 
uh, and, and positively amazed at the extent of, of understanding that he demonstrated for the audience that he was trying to reach in Japan. So those who advised him, or perhaps it was just uh, President uh, Kim dae himself, but he spoke to the Japanese people when he came in 1998 to Japan in a way that I had not heard a, a previous leader, South Korean or otherwise, frankly, speak. Um, and so I think the Japanese people really heard what he had to say and took it to heart that he intended for this relationship between Japan and South Korea to really begin to be a more positive, constructive, and you know, directed at the humanity of both societies. So there was a real impact that he had. Um, he, you know, and it was televised throughout Japan at the time, whether it was in the diet or his dinner with the emperor, he was on TV for the duration of his stay. And he very consciously spoke out to the Japanese people. He understood that that was who was listening to him, not just the government officials or whoever was at the banquet. Um, and I, so I think that's very important. I think when President Yoon does visit Japan, whenever that may be, uh, that engagement with the Japanese people is going to be really important. You have to recognize the challenges, but also set a pathway of optimism for the future. And I think speaking to that next generation would also help. The second thing I would emphasize um, for President Kim Dae-jung's approach is that he obviously, in uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Obuchi, had a very receptive leader on the other side. And here, I think also uh, President Yoon has a very receptive leader uh, on the Japanese side. I think Prime Minister Kishida and his cabinet, including Foreign Minister Hayashi, uh, want to do the hard work uh, required. Now, they recognize, again, the challenges, but I think they see also the strategic importance of making sure that the Japan-South Korea relationship has a foundation that goes beyond one president, one prime minister, but builds upon the relationship, builds a foundation that then subsequent leaders can follow forward with. So I think it's really important uh, that the partners, the Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon, set out not just what are we gonna do in the first or the second or the third conversation we have, but what is our plan that will really plant some roots among politicians, among educators and civil society, but also among the, the diplomats and statesmen that will have to manage the relationship going forward. So I think there's a, there's a holistic plan that they can approach this with, and I would certainly urge them to, to, to take that approach. Great, I think that's uh, very, uh, very good and excellent uh, advices for policymakers and top policymakers like uh, both uh, President Yoon suk yeol and uh, Prime Minister Kishida. Okay, uh, next, uh, uh, Dr. Son yeol please go ahead and uh, take your time. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, honored uh, to be here, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Korea Foundation and uh, CSIS uh, for uh, this great uh, conference, and um, I am, uh, it is uh, it's a bit uh, unusual uh, when you do uh, U.S.-Korea strategic partnership and here's a session about Korea-Japan relationship. Uh, it means, it seems like uh, this particular bilateral relationship is, is vital to uh, uh, the bilo I mean, bilateral uh, relationship between the United States and uh, South Korea. Uh, in that regard, uh, you know, uh, I uh, I like to make uh, three uh, comments, uh, and and those three comments uh, should be related to uh, U.S.-Korea uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, one uh, is that uh, are we? I mean, the the key question is, uh, what's the future of this bilateral relationship, U.S.-Japan? I mean. Uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, will it be improved? Um, it should. It should be improved. Uh, and uh, you know, today uh, we see uh, sort of an improvement. Uh, I think uh, the rising expectations uh, for improved bilateral relationship. Um, I think the uh, United States played a role, important role, um, in ways that. Uh, reactivate uh, you know, U.S., uh, South Korea, Japan trilateral relationships uh, to meet the challenges, uh, you know, you know, economic and, and security challenges. 
So, um, and, and that trilateral relationship, uh, cooperation, has been mentioned in, in two joint statements uh, in, in Tokyo and in Seoul. Um, so, uh, it seems that the United States, in that sense, uh, played the role, uh, and particularly uh, President Biden. Uh, you remember that, uh, you know, Vice President Biden uh, came to you know, Tokyo and Japan back in uh, 2013, and he uh, tried to, you know, play sort of, you know, mediating role. That eventually led to a trilateral summit meeting in Hague uh, next year, uh, 2014. And I think that's, uh, you know, grounded uh, the foundation for the ultimate, uh, you know, comfort woman uh, agreement uh, concluded in December 2015. Um, so uh, this time, uh, I sense that the uh, United States is playing a similar role, not directly uh, involved in history issues, but um, in a more um, sort of, uh, the I mean, uh, strategic ways in which uh, you have this pressing uh, economic and, and, and security um, issues, and uh, there's no way that uh, two countries continue to struggle. So uh, that's a very important message, and I sense that Yoon, President Yoon is, is very much proactive. And also what's interesting to the Japanese side is that the Japanese government position so far uh, has been like, here's an issue of uh, you know, forced labor and uh, Supreme Court ruling, and now, uh, you know, ball is on the Korean court. You study, homework, come up with the solution, and then we discuss and also discuss on other uh, issues, uh, security, economics, and others. Um, and now, uh, Prime Minister Kishida says that this bilateral relationship is too important to be left out. So we got to work now. So I think that's a big change. And that change comes out of, you know, uh, United States role, I think, and particularly the recent visit. So uh, we are um, now on the right track, I think. Um, but uh, the issue is that uh, it's a, you know, perennial issue. Uh, okay, here is uh, the security issues, economic issues, we get together. Uh, so we get to improve uh, the relationship on, on those fronts. But at the same time, there's a history issue. And uh, you, you have to make a parallel progress on the history issues. Otherwise, ultimately, it will be slowed down and interrupted. So uh, particularly uh, the history issue, I mean, uh, here the problem uh, lying between the two countries is that, okay, why don't we just you know, set aside the history issues and you know, work hard on security, economics, climate change, and all others. Uh, that's theoretically possible, but we have a time bomb ticking issues. Uh, you know that uh, there's a you know, Supreme Court ruling uh, and also the court ruling over um, sort of you know, implementing uh, the sale of the Japanese, uh, sale of the assets of the Japanese companies, uh, you know, to compensate the plaintiff, the victims. And, uh, you know, you don't really have much time. Uh, so far, uh, you know, both governments are buying time to uh, postpone the decision, but, uh, you know, that has a limit. So uh, within a year, uh, two parties, uh, two governments need to find solutions uh, to stop this, you know, time bomb ticking. Um, so uh, you, you got to handle these issues uh, while at the same time promoting uh, security and, you know, economic um, cooperation. So uh, how do, you know, resolve uh, uh, this uh, forced labor, uh, you know, selling, uh, I mean, stop selling, uh, the assets of, of the former uh, Japanese company, I mean, here, the Mitsubishi. Um, so that's one uh, really big task for the Yun government and also the Kishida government. And um, 
there are already uh, the choices made, uh, prepared, I think, that, uh, uh, and uh, the Yun, I mean, uh, in Korea and also in Japan, um, it's kind of been you know, a consensus that uh, you only have three choices. One is to, um, you know, establish a, a foundation uh, uh, donated uh, by the Japanese companies and also Korean companies, particularly the Korean companies who, uh, like POSCO, uh, who received uh, uh, economic cooperation money back in uh, 1965. Um, so they established a foundation and, and they uh, provided uh, money uh, to the plaintiff. Uh, that's one choice. And second choice is so-called uh, Kim Young sam um, choice that, uh, okay, uh, the money issues, uh, we don't want Japanese uh, to be paid. You know, it is South Korean governments that deals with all this compensation. In return, Japanese make sincere apologies. So that's the second uh, choice. And the third choice is, is go to the third party legal uh, arbitration, including ICJ ruling. So uh, I think uh, the choices are already there, and it is uh, the decision by uh, President Yoon, and also with help of uh, you know, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, the, which one you, you choose. We know that um, it involves huge political uh, decision, uh, because uh, one, uh, at the moment, I, I wrote it in, uh, in, um, in this paper, uh, talking points that uh, we see um, sort of you know, identity clashes between the two countries that uh, the Koreans uh, view the identity of Japan as still former colonial aggressor, unrepentant aggressor, uh, no apology. And the Japanese uh, depict the Korean sort of, you know, national character was very interesting. Uh, it has been shaped uh, during the past uh, several years that uh, Korea is emotional, irrational, and unreliable partner. So uh, get to take, you know, distancing uh, unless they come up uh, with a new proposal and then change its attitude. So uh, these, uh, you know, public um, attitudes and also uh, top leaders' attitude toward each other has been an obstacle. So somehow you get to move uh, you know, away from that. That's one obstacle. And two obstacle is to Korea. Uh, I gave you uh, the data of the public opinion survey that, that there's a sharp uh, divide within Korea that here, the older Korean people, I mean, according to uh, the public opinion survey, uh, uh, you know, conducted by uh, East Asia Institute, overwhelming number supports improvement of the bilateral relationship. But the next thing is, what is priority? And the progressive uh, say that you get to resolve history issues first. Conservatives say we got to do future-oriented cooperation in security and economics. And two are sharply divided. And um, now uh, it is uh, President Yoon who has conservative base. But when you, uh, you know, come up to this, you know, liquidation issue, uh, you got to deal with, you know, this history issues and there is a sharp divide between uh, the uh, the Korean public. So uh, there are two obstacles, and we'll see how uh, President Yoon uh, will deal with uh, this uh, particular history issues in the context of broader context of uh, bilateral uh, security and economic cooperation. And I think um, um, Victor just mentioned before that uh, whether Korean or uh, bilateral, uh, I mean, the US Korea alliance uh, will go regional and global, uh, we'll see, you know, uh, the NATO summit and what uh, President Yoon said. Uh, we'll see, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, summit meeting, bilateral summit meeting uh, will be held after the Japanese election and what all the messages they are uh, saying 
particularly uh, with regard to these history issues. With that, let me stop. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I think uh, you succinctly uh, pointed out uh, important issues there. Um, if a bilateral issue between uh, South Korea and Japan becomes the issue of identity, it becomes much more complicated and difficult to resolve. And do you think uh, both governments, I mean, uh, both political leaders in South Korea and Japan uh, will be able to mobilize uh, enough uh, political support uh, I mean, to overcome that kind of difficulties coming from identity, I mean, confrontation between two countries? Uh, it's, uh, it should be a very difficult task, uh, particularly, uh, you know, I think that uh, the identity clash um, came out of the leaders' clash uh, between Park and Abe, between uh, Moon and Mr. Abe. And that is spread into the public, whole public. So uh, that is uh, vividly uh, demonstrated in the public opinion survey that, uh, you know, Japanese perception of uh, Korean leader President Moon is, uh, their favorability is, uh, is less than 3%. It's almost statistical error and vice versa. So uh, the very low level of, uh, you know, uh, positive image uh, because, I mean, uh, each country, the public uh, views the other country as what the other country's leaders said and done. I think that's very important. So in that sense, uh, you know, the leader is the key agent of public diplomacy. So I think um, we might hope that uh, President Yoon uh, should play a very important and effective public diplomacy to the Japanese public that um, this is a leader uh, who views Japan or the Japanese identity, not strictly uh, Japan as a former colonial aggressor, but this is uh, this kind of new Japan that you, uh, uh, South Korea really needs to cooperate in order to deal with uh, the global challenges and all, also regional challenges, uh, including the China challenge. Um, and also the Kishida, Mr. Kishida should play a very important role that, you know, this is the country, Korea. Uh, previous session we talked about, and also uh, President Lee, uh, you know, his uh, the opening remarks saying that it's the 10th largest economy in the world with most sophisticated technologies and culture. And the Korean you know, defense budget uh, will almost equal in, in two years with, uh, with that of Japan. So this is a new uh, Korea, not, you know, you can't say irrational, uh, emotional. Um, you're not really, you know, abiding by the rule of law kind of thing. So there should be a, the gap between the real Korea and the Japanese image of Korea. So uh, I think uh, Mr. Ki I think really believe that I think that uh, Mr. Kishida should address um, uh, the real uh, Korea, the real face of Korea that uh, you should uh, deal with. So uh, I think that's the starting point. And then uh, obviously uh, it will take time to address. Uh, sort of, you know, distorted uh, the identity, I mean, image of uh, the other country's identity. Um, so uh, it'll take time, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we can, we can uh, you know, improve uh, in that way. Yeah. Uh, uh, in that regard, I think uh, Dr. Smith's advice uh, to Korean political leader, I mean, the President Yoon Song Yeol, uh, tr to try to speak directly to the Japanese people. I think that, that's an important issue mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, please, uh, uh, Professor Choi Eun-bo. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your warm introduction. 
and it is a great honor and privilege for me to participate uh, in this exciting and timely conference uh, with uh, distinguished scholars, experts, intellectuals, and the policy makers and informed journalists. Uh, I have learned a lot uh, from the keynote speech and uh, presentations in the first session. For initial brief remark, I broadly focused on the current situations of the relationship between Korea and Japan for a contextual understanding. If we look at the broadcasts and newspaper for a couple of recent years, we frequently find the words catastrophe, total difficulty, credibility gap, disfavor, widespread frictions, even a failure of communication. But recently, uh, um, it is good news. Here, partnership and friendship about Korea and Japan. Uh, but this observation leads me to summarize the current situation uh, as abnormality. So then a question comes up, is it possible to improve conflicting uh, Korea-Japan relations to be sustainable and sincere and new normal? Uh, how to get back normalization and reconciliation and confidence rebuilding, uh, as mentioned the previous speakers? Uh, mm. uh, I'm not a naive optimist, but I'm uh, cautiously positive for the future of Korean relations, uh, as uh, I think now is the fresh moment so in order to prepare uh, for the task, uh, I think four pillars need to be highlighted. I will mention the first pillar uh, now, but four pillars uh, include uh, the balanced understanding, the circumstance of a str struggling Korea-Japan relations. The second, the figuring out characteristic of new government, Korean government's uh, policies to the Japan. The third, pinpointing hurdles surrounding the new government. First, mapping out the policy suggestions and alternatives for the forward-looking relations. Let me move to the first pillar in detail uh, now. Korea-Japan relations have been neglected for quite a long time. Cycles of action and reaction and tit for tat by both countries were repeated in a negative way. Even the fourth labor issue, which was called as a time bomb, as mentioned uh, Professor Son, was not controlled effectively. In the case of Japanese military sexual slavery issue, the Korean government deserved in 2018 the Reconciliation Healing Foundation, which was established in 2016 based on the 2015 agreement. The momentum in implementing the 2015 agreement was lost. Some victims even claimed to refer the case to the UN Anti-Torture Commission Committee. Uh, let's look at Japan. The Japan implemented export regulations and deleted Korea from its white country list. Korea declared the termination of GSOMIA, as you know, Japan filed a complaint with the WTO. In addition, other conflictual issues were ruptured. Fukushima nuclear power plant water discharge, territorial disputes, textbook controversies, application for UNESCO registration of Sado mine, which is located in Niigata Prefecture by the Japanese government, etc. Historical disagreements then were deteriorated and spread to complex conflicts. Two countries were bashing and passing each other and fell in a losing game against both. In the latter half of the reign, previous Korean government actually insisted on dialogue with Japan, but Japanese counterparts did not respond it let alone the actual conversation. Japan considered that Korea prioritized the North Korean agenda while recognizing of Japan 
not as a partner, but as a spoiler, which is not uh, true. <laughs> the moreover, a phenomenon appears in which victims and perpetrators are re reversed in Korea-Japan relations. Growing Japan is compared in juxtaposition with decreasing Japan. The scholar argues that the Korea-Japan relations have been transform, transformed for last six decades from asymmetrical and the complementary status to symmetrical and the competitive ones. According to GAP, G GDP, uh, the Professor Sun mentioned, the Korea and Japan was uh, 1 to 30 in 1965, the year of normalization and uh, one to 10 in 1990s, and the one to five in two, uh, 2010, and the one to three in 2020, almost. Uh, in terms of GDP per capita, uh, uh, one to eight in 1965, and the recent almost uh, close each other, and the R&D budget and the even defense spending, the gap between Korea and Japan has become narrowed. As a result of a shift of power and stature, kind of cognitive dissonance occurred and influenced paradoxically on the relations to be shattered. Based on all these outcomes, it is arguably estimated that the previous administration, Korean previous administration policy towards Japan, not successful, even failed, for the lack of accountability and adaptability. It left a negative legacy. However, the previous government is not the only one that was wrong. Cause is indeed historical, structural, and reciprocal. With due regard to the Japan's attitude, Japanese government gave Korea cold shoulder with disfavor and without any efforts to have a dialogue with Korea. Eventually, without the summit meeting, antagonistic race was pervasive in both societies. Some scholars in international politics and foreign policy say three things as essential, one, national interest, two, value, including democracy, rule of law, market economy, human rights, etc., and third, perception, the psychology and identity. So, however, national interest was sacrificed, common values unshared, only emotional showdown was severed with the fever of patriotic nationalism and the populistic propaganda by both governments. So wars were built up to keep two countries apart. Then a COVID-19 certainly attacked all of the world. Moreover, the rivalry between US and China has grown more intense over global supply chain and economic security. Furthermore, Russian invasion of Ukraine brought unprecedentedly a shock. As a return of geopolitics, Korea-United States alliance, and the trilateralism, Korea-United States and Japan uh, under Biden administration become serious matters as a political capital. Yeah, this is reality. Yeah. What is more important is that Kishida became a prime minister in last year, and Yoon became a president in Korea recently. In this context, the theater has been changed, and top leaders as leading actors of both countries could be game changers and icebreakers, in spite of many obstacles. Uh, first session, uh, the, uh, the panelists and the moderator mentioned the leaders matter. So let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, and, uh, uh, presentation. Let me ask just one question. That is, uh, President Yoon Suk-yeol uh, 
said he would improve uh, uh, South Korea's relationship with Japan uh, and uh, to succeed, I mean, to make his policy of uh, improving relationship with Japan successful, he needs to uh, mobilize uh, full support of opposition party members, for example, in the National Assembly. But uh, he won the presidential election with very slim margin of 0.73%. And as you know, the majority seats uh, are occupied by the opposition party. Uh, I think uh, they are occupying 169 seats while the ruling party occupies 114. Uh, do you think uh, President Yoon will be able to mobilize support of the opposition party in pursuing this quite difficult policy of improving bilateral relations? Yeah, thank you for question. Uh, the answer is very difficult. Uh, but uh, logically, uh, without uh, uh, I mean, uh, co-governance in National Assembly, uh, many things will be impossible. That's the, the obstacles the UN government has mm -hmm. to yeah. meet with. For instance, uh, uh, Sonia mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the sub subrogation, uh, the, the liquidation issue. Uh, even that, uh, you mentioned three uh, uh, ideas. Number one is uh, uh, just uh, the three options. Then yeah. then uh, 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 subrogation, then the, uh, the kind of clean up or, or the, the moral legitimacy. The third one is uh, uh, the international the domain, of course. Uh, but I think the first uh, subrogation uh, uh, idea, uh, we can uh, divide the three uh, the scenarios. The first is broad subrogation. Second is a little bit separate subrogation. The third, uh, which is uh, uh, introduced in Korea, the former speaker of uh, National Assembly, uh, idea, uh, that is two plus two, Moon Hee Sang proposal. It's a two plus two alpha idea. I think it is, uh, it is uh, uh, quite reasonable, but uh, by that time, uh, for the uh, schedule of time, uh, it is not accepted. It is not proposed in National Assembly. So even though that kind of idea re uh, highlighted, re uh, addressed, uh, that is uh, National Assembly process uh, must be uh, required for that process. So in that sense, uh, uh, political struggle is uh, very um, high uh, mm -hmm. for the Okay. The Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Ellen Kim, please. Um. Thank you, um, Korea Foundation and CSIS for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about this very important topic. So, um, and also, um, it's my great pleasure to be on this panel with the uh, very distinguished um, scholars on Japan and Korea-Japan relations, so thank you for having me. Um, so I have three points to make. First, um, the RK-Japan relationship uh, in the past several years uh, really deteriorated in unprecedented ways that uh, served neither country's interest. Uh, trust was depleted uh, not, not only because, between the two governments, but also between the people of two countries. And uh, uh, when the existing and uh, new uh, historical disputes um, sort of got politicized and spilled over to economic and secure realms, um, I think that really hurt the very important foundation of the ROK-Japan relationship. 
and also undermine the regional corporations, including US, RK, Japan, trilateralism. And a lack of trust, lack of dialogue, uh, certainly uh, made it difficult for both countries to uh, manage uh, some of the uh, military skirmishes and other un uh, adverse developments, which could have been handled better under normal circumstances. So overall, um, although many of the each, uh, each one of these um, disputes are, uh, are really uh, matters a lot in both countries and uh, carries enormous weight in both countries, um, the overall um, outcome of these um, tensions and confrontations over these disputes at the front and center of the bilateral relationship, I think really uh, hurt, did, did no good to both countries, but only inflicted more pains to the um, victims of the, some of the disputes and hurt the uh, businesses and people in both countries. Second, uh, with the change in government of both countries, I think that um, South Korea and Japan have a now new opportunity to reset their bilateral relationship. And I think um, the bilateral relationship got off to a good start already. Um, and I think President uh, Yoon and um, Prime Minister Kishida now um, need to uh, build on this positive momentum uh, to um, uh, normalize their ties, and I think they are in a very good position to do that. Um, both countries have a, um, aligned, uh, they are aligned in North Korea policy. They have a very strong commitment to democracy, freedom, rules-based international order. Both countries also wanted to establish a stable supply network in both uh, in the regions. And finally, um, President Yoon's uh, recent decision to join the U.S. Indo-Pacific economic framework and interest in Quad and maybe uh, CPTPP may also bring both countries come together and move the dialogue forward. Um, so, so where do these countries uh, go from there? Um, I think uh, my final point is that there are uh, both short-term and long-term um, tasks facing both countries. On the short-term side, I think that both countries need to focus on trust building uh, by working on the issues of their shared interests and use that progress to uh, restore the trust and build a, and deepen the, the uh, expand and uh, enhance their bilateral corporations. And at the NATO summit uh, at the end of this month, I think could be a very good opportunity uh, for the in-person summit between uh, President Yoon and Prime Minister uh, Kishida, uh, which can be followed by their bilateral summit. Uh, sometime after the Japan's um, upper election in June 10th, I think. And both country, both leaders can uh, recognize the importance of each other, strategic importance of bo uh, both countries for their countries, and agree on the uh, future-oriented corporations. And as a sign of good uh, will, um, good will gesture, both, my, uh, both countries may consider uh, putting both countries back on their um, white list of the um, uh, favorable, tra uh, preferable tra uh, trading partners. And at the same time, both countries should um, agree on the true check approach, um, separating the, uh, uh, their disputes, ongoing dispute from the uh, issues of their bilateral corporations. And also, as uh, Professor So mentioned, um, um, sort of proactively uh, manage some of the time sensitive issues like wartime labor issues um, uh, in ways that. Um, um, sort of um, prevent, uh, uh, prevent the um, rup uh, rupture from, um, and rupture in the bilateral relationship and uh, uh, spoiling the future oriented cooperation between the two countries. <clears throat> and um, finally, on the longer term issues, I think that both countries should uh, approach the historic issues uh, with uh, uh, more restraint and patience and through continuous dialogue. Um, these, as history shows, uh, many of these historical issues are really hard to resolve, and unfortunately, many of these issues got much more complex and much more difficult now uh, as they involve uh, legal cases that requires a lot of um, delicate handling. And leadership in both countries also faces enormous uh, domestic barriers that they have to overcome. So um, I think that uh, years of reciprocal uh, efforts uh, with a sincere commitment uh, in both countries should be uh, required to make a meaningful progress in these issues. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. And let me ask this question. You are staying here in, in, in this country, in the United States. And let me ask uh, uh, a question about the role of the United States. Uh, already that issue has been discussed a little bit, but 
uh, the nature of the difficulties we are facing in trying to improve bilateral relationship between Japan and uh, South Korea is uh, very kind of uh, complex and complicated in the sense that in Korea, uh, as I already mentioned in my question uh, to Dr. Che, uh, President Yoon should be able to, uh, I mean, mobilize those majority seats of opposition party from the National Assembly. And in Japan, uh, Prime Minister Kishida should be able to mobilize a strong support uh, from even ultra-conservative and very hardliners. And uh, I think both countries, uh, countries' leaders uh, should be able to, to, to do that at the same time. But that is very difficult. And without solving that kind of dilemma, there is no hope, I think, to solve this uh, problem, difficulties uh, facing I mean, uh, those two countries. And uh, do you think, I mean, American, I mean, U.S. Uh, way of uh, intervening in this uh, issue that is kind of behind the scene, quiet diplomacy, do you think that will be enough to resolve, I mean, uh, this kind of difficult, complicated uh, uh, problem? Um, maybe yes and maybe no. <laughs> um, back in, I think, 2014 or 14, uh, 13, uh, when South Korea um, and Japan ha already have a difficult relationship over these history disputes, uh, President Biden actually um, sort of played a media role to bring uh, President Park and uh, Prime Minister Abe to have a summit together. So at that time, uh, sort of this uh, sort of put a stop in the ongoing tensions in the Western uh, countries. So in that sense, uh, maybe it worked that way, but eventually that actually um, so bad results after the collapse of the uh, Comfort Women Agreement fell apart. So, but right now I think that there are certain roles that America can play, certainly, but not in an open way, but in a back channel. I think encouraging both sides to uh, think about the, their uh, broader um, national interests. Ultimately, I think that you ROK Japan uh, cooperation is very vital for their national interests. Uh, in addressing not, uh, the regional and global challenges. Um, both countries should not overlook their uh, strategic importance of each other. South Korea's national security in part relies and tied to the uh, U.S. forces stationed in, Korea, uh, in Japan and also military assets there. And Japan also needs South Korea to deal with North Korea as well as China and other regional issues. So I think that both South Korea and Japan need to really step out uh, from their um, ongoing disputes and then really see their, reassess their national interests in bilateral regime in a holistic way. Um, and most importantly, I think that uh, both countries should not um, let this discordant historical issues be uh, dri um, driving a wedge in their, um, between them in, when they're facing these greater challenges from North Korea and China. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, may I invite your view on the same question that I raised, please? Thank you, Minister. On, on the U.S. role, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I, it's not to say that I think during the Obama years there was a very concerted effort to facilitate, and that's the word I like to use as opposed to mediate, on some of these issues. And I, I think... Um, Dr. Kim is quite right to reference that period as being a very difficult period in the bilateral and where the United States could play a quiet, supportive role that actually ended up being productive in terms of the Comfort Woman Agreement. But again, at the end of the day, I feel that we should recognize that the United States cannot uh, push the people of South Korea or the people of Japan to a position that is not inherently welcome. And I think we, we, we need to recognize our limits here. Um, but there is a quiet supportive role. There is a referential role perhaps the United States could play. I was intrigued by um, Dr. Sill's three possibilities. Well, maybe there's a different possibility. There is reconciliation efforts that were made in the United States in our domestic political uh, world where we had to deal, of course, with behavior by the US government towards its citizens that was not 
uh, you know, conducive to our constitutional rights. And so there's other ways, perhaps other cases, other instances of reconciliation that could be reference points for the US and I'm sorry, for Japan and South Korea. I honestly have gone back to look at the 1965 agreement and the accompanying agreement on the compensation issues. Um, and I am sort of struck by how wise negotiators were back then about creating this third party mediation framework, um, because I think they understood that this may not be the end of the conversation between the citizens of both countries. And I, I think it's really going to be incumbent on the both governments to be flexible in thinking about ways in which uh, they can approach this. But the United States actually is in a referential role rather than a direct medi mediation role, if that makes sense. That would be my, my approach to that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Son, you, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, you talked about three options, I mean, I mean three choices that both uh, uh, South Korea and Japan can choose. Uh, but you didn't, I mean, uh, evaluate, the, I mean, uh, which is the most, I mean, reasonable option for both countries. What is your uh, personal view or personal evaluation among those three options you mentioned? And why? I mean, uh, my preference is second. That um, you know, this is an issue uh, that uh, the Japanese government and Japanese companies do not want to pay. Um, if that's the case, then uh, my government will will take care of it, and we take uh, the position of moral superiority on the issue. Um, then uh, president really need a courage, um, you know, to, to uh, persuade uh, the people. Uh, that uh, was made uh, in 1993 uh, when the comfort woman issue erupted. And that was during the time when Japanese government prepared so-called the Kono Statement. Um, so uh, I think uh, timing was right at that time, before Japanese government uh, made their uh, statement. So uh, the Kim Young-sam's decision and his uh, decision kind of uh, supported uh, you know, corner statement in that way. I mean, uh, having a corner statement as progressive as possible. Uh, but this time is, is, is difficult, is different. And then uh, the Korean president is, is uh, much more uh, difficult position than uh, President Kim was. Uh, but I think uh, still uh, that's the possibility. Uh, I mean, that's the, the thing that, uh, you uh, resolve it uh, because uh, the first choice uh, Professor Che mentioned, uh, Munisangan or the revised Munisangan, um, I think that's, uh, that's reasonable and, and I think that's desirable, uh, but it, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, it will take time, but uh, during that time, I mean, uh, we saw uh, the history problems like, you know, comfort woman and forced labor. When this, you know, issue came out um, in the government, if you don't handle it quickly, then it lasts for the whole five years, shackled the relationship. That was uh, Park's case and Moon's case. So if you do not really, uh, you know, address this issue progressively in your first year of presidency, I think it will go on and on uh, until the end of this, I mean, the current UN government. So uh, you need um, a decisiveness uh, and courage uh, to, to uh, you know, get it done uh, within uh, the one year uh, when you have a high time and also honeymoon not with the opposition party, but with the public. Um, so I prefer the second choice. 
Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, we have uh, three minutes left, and probably I can open the uh, floor to the audience and just uh, probably have one question from the audience, if you have any. Okay, uh, then I think uh, it's time for, for us to wrap up our discussion. I think it was very uh, I mean, productive uh, discussion. We touched it almost impo every important subject related to our topic of improving relationship between South Korea and Japan. Uh, and I think uh, probably one conclusion, I mean, which comes from all of your presentation is that uh, we need to, I mean, kind of delink uh, uh, history issue from uh, the economic and security issues, and uh, we don't have to hurry about the uh, hurry, hurry to uh, deal with the history issue, which is very difficult, complicated issues. And I think uh, uh, with that uh, in our mind, I think uh, we uh, had better expect, I mean, both governments uh, in South Korea and Japan uh, be able to succeed in their uh, commitment to improve bilateral relationship in coming years. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentations. And Dr. Smith, thank you. And thank you very much for listening, audience. Thank you. lunch now. Uh, we'll be back about 1.30. Lunch is actually served outside in the atrium. <laughs>